Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Deciphering My Experience. My name is Eric, and I am happy to introduce John W. Warner IV. He is a military historian, an author, a former professional race car driver, and the son of former Senator John Warner of, was it Virginia that he was senator out of, correct? Yes. Okay. Last Republican from the state, if I remember correctly. You know, that's a good question. I think I so. I think he's the last Republican senator from Virginia. The rest have been Democrats, I believe. Yeah, Mark Warner is not a relative. A okay. friend of my dad's, but not a relative. Okay, 10-4. And um, we have John here today because he's been, um, I guess, following along to what's been going on in the Deciphering My Experience world. Um, but welcome, John. Thank you for having me. Did I, did I miss anything in the who is John Warner category that you may want to bring forth? Well, there's a slight <laughs> addition. Go for it. Um, I, uh, my mother's side of the family is the Mellon family, the banking family from Pittsburgh. So my dear friend and third cousin is Chris Mellon, former uh, deputy undersecretary of intelligence, uh, undersecretary of defense for intelligence. Not sure if that's a made-up title or not, but it sounds like it. I tease him about that. And, um, of course, my grandfather, Paul Mellon, was a World War II U.S. Army officer, uh, formerly of the Cavalry Unit at Fort Riley, Kansas. But he went into the OSS because he knew Wild Bill Donovan uh, from social circles in Washington. And um, that's a very interesting story, the story of the Mellon family. Uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, a friend of mine, said uh, to me a long time ago, and he says it publicly, that the Mellon family is the first family of intelligence. And I'll tell uh, your listeners that the Mellon family, there's only about 130 of us alive at any one time, something like that. And so we're not a very big family. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wealth. Um, we are a committee of 300 family for those into conspiracy circles, which I certainly am. And uh, so full disclosure on that. Um, and military officers and retired admirals that I've spoken to that are friends of my father over the years tell me there's been, I think around 40 melons in the intelligence services since World War II. I don't have all their names, but uh, you know, I've done some digging on my grandfather and uh, it all makes sense to me. I'm glad that you brought up the um, Committee of 300 Association. I wasn't sure if you were going to divulge that because I appreciated that when we, we spoke earlier in the week. I thought that was fantastic um, that you were bringing that up because you had said that, you know, that it shouldn't only be Laura Eisenhower out there being the only one getting to say stuff. And I agree with that 100%. I mean, these there's 300 families. Why is it that yeah. there's not more people discussing these things? So thank you very much for for what you're doing. Well, let me speak to that. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Laura Eisenhower, the Eisenhower family is a committee of 300 family. I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure they're, you know, American Illuminati, which is a catch-all phrase. Um, I would say from all those people that I know, and I know hundreds of them, I've met them. Um, most are very nice people, very generous. Um, they have a shit ton of money. Um, they're more concerned about their yachts and their travels and their, you know, this, that, and the other than really delving into history. I'm a historian, so, and uncovering, you know, I'm, my specialty is World War II, um, but I've studied all of history, and I understand the Anunnaki and their significance to our history. But you ask these people, they have no clue. And so I know I have two or three family members that are 25 to 30 percent awake. I'm guessing, but they're nowhere near where you and I are and people like Kerry Cassidy and Simon Parks and Alex Collier and, you know, Penny Bradley and all the super soldiers, that kind of, what I like to say, the end of the rail line in the disclosure movement because it encompasses the very, very difficult and horrifying stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about that. I, I through my <laughs> studies as a historian, um, the lies that were taught in history. I mean, history was a set of lies agreed upon, said Napoleon, supposedly. And he was right. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back in our history, all the books, you know, they're, they're all sort of the official. In other words, let me use this new book my wife got me. It's a very good book. Uh, the Secrets of World War II. And there's lots of interesting, beautiful photographs. That's the OSS and Wild Bill Donovan. But they have two pages on it. So this is all the approved, safe, mm -hmm. hidden history of World War II. You know? yep. They're not going to tell, tell you about the Vril Society, the Tula Society of Germany. They're not going to you know, talk about uh, the 1897 airship mysteries or the Sonora Aero Club of the 1850s, where I think the Prussians figured out basic anti-gravity propulsion from the Vedic texts in India and other sources, esoteric sources. So they're not going to talk about the occult or anything of that nature. You know, these books, I have to read 10 books to get like 30 pages of decent information. And, you know, Joseph Farrell writes very good books. He's a theologian from Oxford, but, um, you know, I'm not big on religion, but it's, it's, I, it's mind control. And that's from my own experience growing up. I went to a religious school like you did and, you know, forget it. I just quit that when I was 11. I was like, this is nuts. It's so boring. It's, you know, I stopped praying and singing and they came down on me in like a ton of bricks. But, I, you know, I was a bad student, little rebel. You know, I, it was the 70s, mm -hmm. you know. But getting back to, you know, the, the books, you know, they have a, so much of them have disinformation. And I don't know if you know the story. William Tompkins wrote in his book, uh, I think, Selected by Extraterrestrials. Now, the book isn't very well written, but it's containing a lot of good information, I believe. And he said that there was this admiral, Rico Boda. He was a rear admiral in World War II. And I've got a picture of him. And the only reason we have a picture of him is because there was a World War II uh, veterans of naval aviation. And they said, this is our admiral. He was a great guy. you know, And they were a Navy flight unit. All of their picture, that's the only picture on the internet of him. And so I, I said years ago to my dad, I said, this admiral, I need to mention him in the book I'm writing now. Um, and I said, let's do a FOIA request. And he says, no problem. You know, I, you know, I'm a former secretary of the Navy. I'll, I'll get it done. And the, the Pentagon sent him nothing. First, they said the Admiral didn't exist. And then he picked up the phone and said, look, I'm looking at a goddamn picture of this Admiral Rico Boda. I want some information. And they were like, oh, okay. He was, you know, involved in this fighter wing, you know, this naval fighting unit, you know, carrier unit. And that was it. <laughs> and so we did a FOIA request through all different agencies, nothing. So that tells you how they can scrub people from history. Um, and I mentioned him in my new book, which is in, entitled Lion, Tiger, Bear, mm -hmm. which I have FDR, Roosevelt, um, President Roosevelt, Churchill, and General Marshall having their meeting in 1942 discussing the Foo Fighters. And what people don't know, they don't tell you in these books, is the OSS, one of their main jobs when they were created, and of course, you know, they, they hired a lot of uh, rich, well-traveled people who knew a lot of, had a lot of connections, like my grandfather and Julia Child and Carl Jung, uh, whom my grandfather all, <laughs> all knew very well. And so they were also tasked with the Foo Fighter issue. And Roosevelt had the IPU in secret, which was the interplanetary unit. And, you know, flying uh, UFOs had been crashing in, a, in America since the thirties, as well as in Germany purportedly. Mm -hmm. And so FDR, you know, he gave it to Jimmy Doolittle and he wrote a, a report. I think it's real. I have a copy of it. He says, look, these things are interplanetary. <laughs> the Germans deny them. <laughs> the British deny them. Everyone's confused. And they were popping out of the ocean in uh, the South seas and the Navy was firing upon them. And FDR being a Freemason with Churchill and Marshall, they, they kind of knew the, the secret history of the world. And they said, you know, you are not to fire upon those unless they fire upon you first. Now, they did interfere with some of the bombers, their electrical and radio equipment. And, uh, but I don't think it was a, uh, an attack. It was more, they were some sort of plasma drone probes. That's what Foo Fighters were. Some sort but of they were seeing all kinds of things during the war. You know? <clears throat> 
And my grandfather told me he saw a UFO in France, you know. But the reason I got started on all that stuff, I, I've always been interested in, you know, Star Trek, uh, everything when I was a kid. And I always believed in it. I said, it's coming 10 years. And they were like, 10 years goes by, nothing happens. And on and on and on. But in 1993, um, I was in California racing at Sears Point. And my teammate, out of probably synchronicity, you know, father had worked in Lockheed Market. And he said, oh, you're interested in all this. He saw me reading a book about, I don't know, something, Roswell or something. The new evidence, you know, some bullshit, you know. And I was reading that. He said, listen, my father was involved with all that stuff. Let me send you something on the internet. And I didn't even have the internet yet. So I went home and got AOL dial-up in Northern Virginia. And he sent me the Majestic 12 files and said, you need to print these out, read them, and then show them to your dad. He's on the, arm, he's chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and he sat on the Select Intel Committee. So in 1993, I was 31, and uh, I went and I said, what do you think of these? My dad read them. He said, this is really interesting. Let me borrow these for a while. Well, four months goes by. I said, hey, man, what's the deal? Are they real? Is this a hoax? What's going on? He said, oh, well, Pentagon, the FBI, and the Navy tell me it's all bullshit. It's, it's a hoax. Don't worry about it. Just, just live your life and have fun. He would always say that. Live your life and have fun. I said, Dad, what do you think? This, you know, I'm no expert, but I've read other people on the internet examining them. They're extremely detailed. They're expertly written with all kinds of the code words of the day. And, you know, and we went back and forth for a month on this. And I finally said to him, listen, man, I'm your son. I've been all over the world with you to Navy bases far and wide. I've been to the Buckingham Palace to meet the freaking queen three times. You know, I've been with you everywhere. I've been with you to see Gorbachev, you know, and the Kremlin. We went on the Codel Dole mission, which is a congressional delegation mission. I said, I've, I've been carrying your briefcases all over the world since I was eight years old because he would take me with him everywhere. My parents were divorced. My mother was a hippie. She was protesting outside the Pentagon during the Vietnam War. And my dad's working in the Pentagon. Yeah, that didn't go over well in like the, the DC gossip rags. <laughs> and so we had it out. And I said, listen, pal, you know, I know you better than anyone. And he said, son, listen, leave it alone. Don't go down that road. You know, the military has this in hand. Live your life you know, enjoy yourself. And I said, dad, with all due, due respect, how the hell can I live my life and enjoy myself when this proves everything that everyone has been saying about UFOs and alien visitation and the involvement with our U.S. military? And he said, you know, do what you got to do, but, you know, don't talk to me about it anymore. And so in 19... Later on, Stephen Greer held a 2001 UFO uh, meeting at, at, at the Congress, and I think only one congressman showed up. No one showed up. But they tried to get people. And, you know, in 2010, I listened to one of Greer's podcasts, and he said, well, I tried talking to Senator John Warner about it, and he said, you know, no way I'm going to be on your UFO, you know, roundtable. And so this is all starting to gel for me. You know, when people on the internet are mentioning my dad and, and UFO secrecy and Majestic 12 and, you know, the military industrial complex and unacknowledged special access projects and black funding and the black budget, you know, this is all getting very real and down to earth for me fast. And so, you know, I know... My dad was a great mentor. You know, I know that the government's corrupt. He, he admits that, you know, every senator and congressman is bought and paid for by special interests. And he aligned himself with the Navy and Marines because he had been a Na you know, Navy personnel. He was a Navy seaman second in World War II, a radio man. And in Korea, he was a, a first lieutenant in the first Marine Air Wing as a code. He flew second seat in an Avenger dive bomber doing artillery spotting. And he saw, you know, they got shot at. Mm -hmm. Almost died. They they took a shell through the canopy. He's a warrior. Yeah. So he's a combat veteran. Mm -hmm. You know. 
And I've grown up with the Navy and Marines. I mean, they fed and clothed me in, in a sense, you know. I mean, I come from an extremely wealthy family, but I, you know, they took care of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had a, an ensign assigned to me in the Pentagon when I was like 11, because I would wander into the war room, you know, with a friend of mine who's now a federal judge mm -hmm. in DC. And we got arrested by the MPs. This admiral said, well, what the hell are these kids doing in here? Get them out of here. They're looking at the big board. Mm -hmm. You know, we were 11, 12, and we didn't know what we were looking at. But, you know, I had this osmosis history yeah. with me. And I've been all around the world meeting royalty and all these big people. And I don't care for European royalty. And I don't care for the Queen Elizabeth. Um, those people gave me a dark feeling. And in 2007, I went with dad to the White House. And Bush, Cheney, and Rumsfeld were there in the Oval Office. And they named a submarine after him, the USS John Warner, a Virginia-class attack submarine. And I was with my ex-wife. And I later, I turned to her. I said, my gosh, it, I got a cold chill down my spine with these guys. You know, I think they're, the 9-11 stuff is real. I think this is dirty. I think these people are dirty. And she goes, I think you're onto something. Because she got that feeling as well. And so I, I'd also... I remember in 2002, because I, I had been at Ground Zero the day before 9-11. I stayed at a hotel. My friend works in the Twin Towers. I was there the day before. And I was like, ah, I got to go home to Connecticut for something, you know, work on my car in the garage. And then I saw it on TV as it was happening. And then the next day, I grabbed a shovel and a hard hat and, a, a, you know, one of those orange vests, like you, you said you were doing. And I said, you know, no one will bother my friend and I if we go down there and look official. And we got through the barricades and walked all the way down to ground zero. Well, there was nothing to do. You know, and the, I remember being next to the hospital and there were no, there was one guy in there and they had a thousand beds. And so a year after that, I was looking for the wreckage at the Pentagon. Most people ignore that. Maybe not anymore, but back then that most people ignored that. And I showed it to dad. I had, I had my computer and the internet. I said, I'm a pilot. You know, I'm a private pilot you know where's the debris where's the mark where the wings went in something's odd here and he said you know son just you know that's the way it happened you know i said this might be a cruise missile I, you know that's just the way it happened leave it alone and that's when i knew my dad was lying to me about a lot of stuff i mean i knew he'd been lying about the majestic 12 stuff mm -hmm. but that was national security and i kind of still believed in you know that america was america instead of right you know, a bunch of factions instead of states. When it starts and, looking like America attacked America, there's some good questions to be asked. Right. And as you know, being a veteran, um, the Pentagon, all branches of the military are incredibly compartmentalized and mm -hmm. factionalized. Yep. Hundreds, Absolutely. thousands. I have no idea. Yep. Because I've had admirals, you know, talk to me, you know, with tears in their eyes and like, you know, I can't talk about any of this stuff. You're a civilian. You can dig this in, you know, here's somebody you should talk to. And I went and talked to that guy. He turned me on to another woman and she turned me on to someone else. And they basically say, well, I know this. Exactly. But, you know? Yep. But I'll turn you on to somebody else who could speak more to that project. I would say and I'm a big a fan of... And a writer, I just follow the dots. I'm a big fan of decompartmentalization. And I think similar to your past, um, you've just had the benefit of like just being in cool rooms when things were going on, right? Yeah, I mean, you I, got there I, because I, of your, of your father, right? So that's what I got and, there because of my career is fair enough. I, I just got there for different reasons. I would wind up being in a really cool room because there was a plumbing problem. Well, that was cool. <laughs> I love all that in Antarctica. Oh, well, I mean, well was, yeah. It's I would have loved to have done that. You know, there there would be like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there were secret meetings going on where I had to show up and fix the bar sink in the middle of stuff. And like, you it probably blank slated you afterwards. You have, He'll never remember. You have no idea the rooms that I've been in and the conversations that I've had. Like, I've, I, 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 I can't tell you how many times I've actually been fixing a bar sink in a mansion on the Gold Coast of Long Island where some rather affluent folks are sitting down having cigars and having cocktails early in the afternoon in a grand old time. And next thing I know, I'm sitting down with them brought into the conversation because I know everything they're talking about and more, and it blows their mind. And then yep. they're all like, ho, 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 this is my plumber. Oh, my boy, I have the smartest plumber in the world. Yeah. Now they're, now they're all bragging. Like, cause you know how they do that. You know, they're like, yeah, everything's better than yours in that environment. 
my car is better than yours. My roof is better than yours. My plumber is better than yours. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I know a lot of these people. I've met the Koch brothers. I've met all these people. And most of them are pretty self-absorbed and into their own thing. Um, if I had to guess, it's what I told you before. It's I have my Warner 10% rule. And what I think is going on in these committee of 300 families and these uber, super duper wealthy folks that are worth trillions with no names, maybe Pazer in France. And, you know, of course the British royal family is worth hundreds, maybe quadrillions, I don't know. But um, these committee of 300 families, um, the way it works, I think, is what I found out is through the occult, my knowledge of the occult. Now, secret societies like Skull and Bones and, and Scroll and Key at Yale, which my grandfather was a scroll and key, Paul Mellon, um, is that they recruit these bloodline family members. And I remember a fraternity at, at University of Virginia tried to recruit me and a friend of mine because we were from these families. And my friend said, oh, this is great. And I said, screw these guys. They wear coats, they wear coats and ties, man. I'm, I'm out of here. You know, no matter how much drugs or whatever they, they said, you know, they, were, they would give us. I didn't give a damn. But what they do is these secret, you know, at UVA, there's these secret societies called the Seven and Imp. And no one knows the members until they die. They put it on their headstones. And so like scrolling key and all this stuff, they tap these little fascist rich kids. You know, I was a rich kid, but I certainly wasn't a fascist. You know, I was a little rebel hippie, you know, kind of. I love the military, but I also, you know, wanted to be an I anarchist. think your father would have tolerated a certain level of rebellion in you, yeah. but if you went towards fascism, I think he would have rectified that. You no, know, he's very much in the middle, which a oh. lot of people call him a rhino. Oh, but fair enough. But Sam Nunn and other Democrats, Ted Kennedy, you know, I they think were his Navy best man, friends. He's pretty much anti-fascist. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, but that's how they do it. They, they tap these kids, mm -hmm. these boys, mostly out of these families. And then they go on to Wall Street or a law firm or banking job or, or the military. And they're like, oh, join this club with us, drinking club, you, know, you need to meet this person and that person. And the next thing they know, they're at a party, like eyes wide shut, or they're at something called, you know, the Bohemian Grove in California. And they put a Mickey in their drink. Even if they're a fascist and they you know, want to go along with the deep state program, you know, it doesn't matter, they want to make sure they need a hook and uh, yeah and so they give them a mickey and they they end up in a bed full of naked kids and they've got you by the balls for the rest of your life and so even if you're on board with 100 percent, you don't care about that and then they make you you know they do satanic ritual abuse and all that stuff with you know at the bohemian grove the giant owls representative of uh inana and hecate and moloch you know that's black enochian magic babylonian magic and, you know, when I started researching all that stuff from my books, you know, because the Nazis were into it, the SS, the Tool and Villa Society and Himmler and the Norse Asatru, uh, solar cults and, and all that stuff. It, all these threads wound their way and, into a very tight, tightly knit rope. And that's what I do in my book, Little Anton. And uh, people want to know my website's littleanton.com. Thank you very much. And, I'll have uh, a link in that in the description. Yeah, and when I have my new book out, um, which has much more disclosure in it, um, I don't, I don't uh, mix up names. <clears throat> I name the names, I name the programs, I name the people involved. I don't change stuff. Other authors, they, they nibble around the edges of the butter cookie and they're like, well, you know, Project, you know, Dingle Dongle, you know, and it's like, no, that was Project Kronos, the Nazi bell, mm -hmm. Red Mercury, you know. Plasma Accelerators, Unified Field Theory. And Walter Gerlach is, is a character in my new book. And also Ferdinand Porsche, uh, but he had, I don't think he had anything to do with the occult, but he was into making, uh, he made a prototype tiger tank, which is in my new book, the Porsche Tiger. People get that mixed up. The Henschel Tiger is the one that went on to fame, but Porsche did do three uh, Krupp turret uh, Porsche Tiger tanks. And then he built, uh, later on, the Ferdinand uh, mobile artillery guns for the Russian front. But um, he's a great character to write about because my first book has to do with the Nazi uh, Grand Prix program, Mercedes and Auto Union, the Silver Arrows and the Silver Fish. 
competition. And Hitler funded that as, as a uh, propaganda. You know, Formula One back then was called Grand Prix, and it was every bit as big as Formula One is today. I mean, it was people went crazy over it worldwide. Mm-hmm. And in fact, when the when the German teams came to America to race in Long Island at Vanderbilt Raceway, mm-hmm. uh, the Americans said, "Where are the where are the swastikas?" And they're like, "Oh, well, you know, we don't put them on unless we have to." And they're like, "Put them back on." The Americans want to see the Nazi Aryan Superman's race and win. And of course they did most of the time, not always, but most of the time. I've been doing a lot of research into that Vanderbilt Motor Parkway as of late because. Oh yeah. The Illuminati families and their racetracks and their, their flying yacht clubs, you know, Oh yep. yeah. Put my plane by the pool. Oops. <laughs> Ab gas spilled into the pool. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, that, that thing you posted about the, uh, the Long Island Aero Club. Yep. Yep. You, you, you know, flying was extremely dangerous. I'm a private pilot, mm-hmm. you know, Flying it in the 30s was extremely dangerous. Oh, yeah. Engines weren't that reliable. Uh, airstrips were few and far between. You know, you had rough gear to land in fields, which I've done, cornfields, in an emergency. And was, um, Long Island was called the cradle of aviation for a yes. reason. It was the birth Rumming, of, yeah, it really was the birth of the entire industry, um, top to bottom. And yeah. you have to realize that people like pilots then were, I mean, taking a class and buying a plane and, 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 and p- plane construction was any Joe blow that was like, ah, oh, I can make a better plane than you. Yeah. Well, same today with kit airplanes, mm-hmm. experimental aircraft. Um, but they're really hard to certify. Yeah. These were going international though. <laughs> yeah. In the thirties, you could put, you know, a couple of bicycles with a, you know, a lawnmower engine and a wing and well, you know, mm-hmm. Warner Hecker it's yeah, special, exactly. you know, and it, but yes, but it so wasn't really safe. I've been I've been finding that 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 Vanderbilt Motor Parkway has a, a deeper history than I thought, and it was something that it's it's been in the forefront of my mind my whole life because we would ride our bicycles on an old section that was um, abandoned and used as an easement for power lines to rip through the neighborhoods now. So, you know, they have like a historical sign when you're at like, you know, the the main road. Um, So we knew that, you know, oh, they used to race cars here. Now we race our bikes here. You know, that was the extent of what we knew. But now the more that I'm looking at it and getting these aerial shots and looking at exactly where this road went and what it connected to and what the lay of the land was at the time, it's just, it really cracks me up because now everything I know about the building trades just shows that like that was the way for them to, you know, go from the city out onto the island, connect all of their country clubs, like the golf clubs, the aero country clubs and stuff like that, but still keep everything due south from their houses so it's not too noisy because all the houses were up on the North Shore. Oh, and there's a they race separated track. this by the farmland. They had the farmland in between the rich mansions on the North Shore, and then just below the farmland, they threw all the roads in and all the industrialization and stuff like that and equipment. It's funny. Oh, the, they have Virginia International Raceway in Southern Virginia has condos, mm-hmm. so you can have your, you know, your, your rich guys have their, you know, the poser drivers probably mostly, you know, they go and have their race cars and they go for the weekend and watch races from their condos. And they're nice condos. And there's a, a racetrack near Aspen, Colorado. Um, my sister lives in Basalt. And boy, the locals went nuts and said, don't you dare put a damn racetrack up there. But because Aspen has so many billionaires, mm-hmm. they got it through. Yep. And a race car runs like shit at 8,200 feet. There's the air. You know, yep. Whatever. It, it's nonsense. But... Uh, I'm like, but Long Island, we should talk about Long Island. I, I have a question for you, actually, because of your um, experiences, your past, and your research, and straight up, the association to Magic 12, right? So your dad's on that list, and I'm wondering, did you ever cross paths or hear of a man named Lloyd Berkner? I've heard of him, and I've read about him. Okay, because he... I never crossed... I'll tell you who I did, who was MJ12, was Admiral Bobby Ray Inman. Okay. And I remember. Uh oh. Rut row. Come on now. You froze up. Oh, there you are. Woof. Uh, deep states on us. Yeah, Man, right. I-, uh, I lost you at uh, who was the guy? Bobby Whom? Right. So, an MJ12 member who knew everything about. The national security state, the secret space program, 
all the black projects, everything mm -hmm. in the 90s was Admiral Bobby Ray Inman. Okay. He's a very, very good friend of my dad's going back to when my dad was Secretary of Navy and he was a commander. So I remember this guy. Mm -hmm. I also, uh, as an, it's interesting, I just want to throw that in there. Uh, when I was a little kid, Admiral Zumwalt lived in my house for a year. And he was reorganizing the Navy and, you know, more rights for minorities and women and everything. And so he and my dad worked closely together on that. And so he lived in my house for a year. And I saw him at every breakfast, you know, 0630 breakfast, you know, at, you know, you know, Ad, Admiral Bobby Ray. I mean, um, not Bobby Ray, but Admiral Zumwalt. Mm -hmm. But anyway, in the 90s, I remember Admiral Inman very well. And since then, I know that he knew everything. Because I remember I, every admiral or general, I always ask them, well, what do you think of UFOs? And, you know, and sometimes they're like, ah, that's ball, bullshit, kid. You know, but I would always ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, some of them were very forthcoming. They're like, because they knew, you know, I was a young man in my 20s or something, or even younger. And they knew no one would believe me. Mm -hmm. And who cares, you know, son of a senator, who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and nobody did. Operation Deep Freeze. I wore the parka at school as a kid. I got my, you know, my dad and Luz Taylor were drunk one night in Switzerland. And I had been asking dad about Operation Deep Freeze for years. And I was 14. And I would read the top secret briefings on his desk. And he got really pissed at that. <laughs> and I didn't understand them all, but I knew there were sub bases. And I said, did they drill them? Is it true? They drill drilled them out with steam hoses. And he had had a few drinks and he said, yeah, it's true. And I said, why do we need sub bases at, in our Antarctica? He says, well, the Russians have them. We have to counter it. I said, okay. I knew about the Russians and the Cold War a lot, even at 14. And uh, being a World War II enthusiast. And I said, well, what else is down there that's so damn important that you got to dig out these giant, you know, I understood the geothermal stuff because I looked it up, live school library, you know, everything I could read on Antarctica. And he pointed up, it was nighttime in Switzerland in the stars, he said, space operations. And I had no idea what that really meant other than like satellites and I don't know, missile navigation. I have no idea until the early 2000s when I had started to read snippets about Antarctica in Nick Cook's book. I had him on my website as a podcast, Nick Cook. The hunt for zero point mm -hmm. and it said the germans built an antarctic base in neuschwabenland and i said shit because i read about the, the 1938-39 expedition when i was a schoolboy. that's all i would do i would be i wouldn't do my homework but i would be in the library looking up stuff on world war ii and warfare in general and history and all that because that's what i cared about and um just so you know, Berkner, the guy that I'm asking. And then I about. put the two together and I'm like, if we had sub bases under the ice and something to do with space, so probably the Germans did too. And this was before I think someone broke the story about, you know, German, you know, Hanabu and Vril flying saucers. I mean, it was very unbelievable. And, and people still think it's ridiculous, you know, Nazis on Mars and the Antarctica, you know, flying saucers, Hitler, you know, the boys from Brazil. Berkner, this guy, was one of the but, radio men for Admiral Byrd when they went down there originally. He was on the 38 expedition with the Germans. Berkner. I've, no, Byrd. He had been an advisor to the Germans going back to the 20s. See, oh, the I'm Germans sorry. had been going, I see what right. The Germans had been going to Antarctica since 1915. Oh, right, right. Yes, the Germans have been going there a very long time. I was saying Berkner went with Byrd for his first American right. expedition. Yeah, they said they needed fishing and well oil. <laughs> yeah. yeah, people oh, people, have been, people have been functionally going down to Antarctica for a long time for the standard resources, um, and it's a very harsh continent. But yes, then there was a lot more subterfuge involved. Go for it. And um, they wound up having to do, you know, all kinds of other things there without everybody knowing it. But the um, the idea of the steam being used to drill that out i thought it was a, a great tidbit of info because i've been trying yeah, to bird build. bird mentions that i think in his diary the it's geothermal has been long known you know if you're going to throw money at the problems in antarctica is really the only issue it's just logistics and money like you can still get stuff done and I spent a year, 
and plumbing. And plumbing. I was going to say, yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Of, I've, well, like geothermal plumbing. steam and, and, and water that needs to be plumbed. Every, every huge, va- you know, huge valves. And, you know, you and I are both gearheads. You know, uh, I love that stuff. You know, I look at the world as plumbing. Seriously complex piping and plumbing. Everything's plumbing. Human beings are plumbing. Doctors are just plumbers for a different type of plumbing, but they're just doing yes. plumbing. I can attest to that being 59 years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> plumbing is an issue. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. One of the things I was talking about. I'm not about, concentrating my real energy. energy enough in my lower GI. I was in an interview one time and somebody had brought up, they were saying, you know, well, how come the, it takes, you know, they say that, you know, the Russians, it, it was talking like Vostok and how you have to drill and how long it takes. And I was like, this is absurd. Like, you know how fast you can get through the ice? Like I, and I like, yeah, I threw it out. A, plumb I was like, bob, a heated, a heated oh, plumb bob. So fast. So fast yeah, to they, get through the ice. You ever hear the story of Greenland where they found two P38 lightnings under the ice? Yep. Yeah. They used a giant copper plumb bob. It melts like two feet a minute. So That's, it's actually um, those those recovered planes um, are a good story because they know the date that they lost them. And in addition to yes, they sunk in and so on and so forth. But what they also learned is that the um, the snow accumulated in the area. It it accreted, not receding though, whatever. Um, at a rate that was way beyond what their science had taught them at that point. So right. they had basically learned to shut their mouths about glaciers receding as if it's such a big deal, as if it took so long for it to grow, and they're learning their numbers are way off. Right. Now, I, I'm a contributor to a, a, a alternative history forum. Mm-hmm. It's called StolenHistory.net. Okay. And on there, we do discuss that story of the P-38 lightnings because uh-huh. – First of all, that was a lot of expense to go get two fighter planes. I mean, P-38s, badass aircraft, Allison engines, turbochargers, mm-hmm. you know, but come on. You know, th- there had to have been some other program going on with that or something. And, and of course, in Antarctica and the Arctic, they have probably zero point energy plumb bobs the size of a school bus, you know, to drill an ice tunnel, you know, something like that. And um, so we dig out a lot of those anomalies of history. Uh, the first forum was attacked and taken down, but now we have it back up and running on 10 different servers worldwide. So we discuss a lot of things. It's, it's a very civilized forum. It's not like other ones that are broken down. Uh, they'll throw you off if you're rude. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be, you know, you can't just say willy nilly racist things, you know, they'll throw you off. So anyway, I wanted to plug that, but also, um, you know, Project Ice Worm in Greenland, mm-hmm. that's an interesting story. Big time. Right. But if you want to talk about Long Island, I, you know, oh, no we as uh, uh, many uh, tangents as we can. Uh, you know? yeah. One of the things um, I find very interesting about Project Ice Worm is because I worked at the South Pole facility. When I watch the Ice Worm videos, that is exactly how they built the arch tunnel system at South Pole as well. The way that they cut the ice Literally, I could. I have videos. I could show you videos that I have where it's the same assembly, the way that they cut the ice, mount the pieces down, and put the corrugated steel over. It is. It is the exact same method. The construction of ice worm and South Pole's tunnel systems. Yeah. So then, when I see that, and I start to then go, well, what other parts of these programs were precisely the same? I mean, they, exactly. they just, it's like, like they just slap one on the North Pole and one on the South Pole. I mean. That was another one of those folders on my dad's desk when he was Secretary of the Navy, mm-hmm. the red ones that mm-hmm. said classified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, ooh, mm-hmm. man, this looks cool. You know, my friend and I are looking at, oh. And Project Ice Worm, you know, that's when they had, you know, they had missile silos. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were keeping tabs on the Russians and other things. But my guess is there were probably, maybe, ancient tunnels that went down far, far below. Because that was part of Ultima Tula, that the German Brill and Tula Society were interested. You know, that whole Arctic area up there was Ultima Tula. Uh, Americans pronounce it Thule, but it's Tula in German. And so one wonders why, why we went to the expense of, you know, and as you know, it's incredibly expensive and time-consuming to heat and supply those Arctic bases. Yes, and that Camp Century was massive. Oh, huge! 
That was and massive. it was most things are most things that are really cool are underground. Mm -hmm. you know, Stephen Greer said it. You know, everything critical is underground. Absolutely, for obvious reasons. Yep. Spy satellites. You know, peering. You know, UFOs and everything. But you know, I, I read recently about HARP that HARP can also see underground a couple yes. hundred miles. Oh, so, I would say every part of the Dan, oh. you know. Well, correct. This it's you can you can um, you can harden something by having it underground, um, but everything has some sort of a signature, so to say. There's a truth out there, right? And there's always a way yeah. to ascertain a truth. So if you have a facility underground, you can harden it from a lot of things, but somehow, lo and behold, we have a technology harp now, and it can just look for cavities. It could look for materials. It can hunt. So you might not be able to hit it with a missile per se, but you can certainly get an eye on it. Well, it's like the other back engineers things we have in our overt society, you know, cling wrap, which is my favorite, fiber optics, carbon fiber, you know, Kevlar, uh, microchips, tr you know, transistors in the old days, you know, why not harp, you know? Absolutely. I mean, once people get over the hump, as I call it, mm -hmm. and, you know, come on. We've been back engineering stuff, you know, from extraterrestrial sources for forever. Who knows? Gutenberg Press, you know, it goes back, you know, the pyramids, you know, it, you know, we, you know, the, the dirty laundry in the military industri industrial complex that Chris Mellon won't talk about. And I, I we talked about this mm -hmm. is the dirty laundry, whatever that is. Now, I said, I said to Chris, I said, look. I know you and Elizondo are on a short, you know, DIA, CIA, Pentagon leash. You know, I didn't, didn't say leash, but I said, you know, tether. And I said, look, I appreciate that. You, you guys have brought a dead topic alive in the New York Times and on CNN. The, you know, finally my friends would say, oh, Warner's not such an idiot after all. There are, you know, there are UFOs, the Navy, in the Navy, apparently. And um, he and I agreed that he, from his end, and he's quit TTSA, obviously, him and Elizondo quit. Yeah. Is that an agenda? I, I don't know. I haven't talked to him recently, but, you know, when I talked to him, I said, listen, I know I'm into the wild stuff. And he said, you and Tom DeLong are into the wild stuff. You know, Tom DeLong, I don't know the guy. I, his heart's in the right place, but it seems like they're really, you know, his book with Peter Lavenda, Secret Machines, was very ginger snap and lemonade. Wow, a black triangle crap. You know, I think they mentioned the word extraterrestrial once. You know, big deal. And I said to Chris, I said, Chris, with all due respect, you know, if you don't believe in the wild stuff, what are you doing with Tom DeLong? And he said, oh, well, Tom's a great guy. And we thought, you know, we'd do this young person's entertainment thing. And I was like, that's weird too. You know, and then they're trying to raise money. He's, he, he, Christ, he got, uh, he tried to hook me up with Hal Putoff, and Putoff needed funds for his underwater quantum communication system that he's got on paper for the Navy. And I said, I said to Chris, no, don't you think the Navy already has that? You know, they've been using zero point energy for 40 years or more. You know, it's they've like been using anti gravity the, craft for 40 years <laughs> or more. With the Sonora Aeroplug. Yeah. Now, for people who just need to wrap their heads around and consider that anti gravity, like first and foremost, it, it is a thing in nature. You can have gravity. You can have anti-gravity. Yes. That's simple. So now, yields, right. So whatever, by whatever definition you want to call it, let's just yield to the fact that it's always possible, just like way back when we didn't know that we could fly, but we learned we can fly. So now we have to deal with we can fly. Flying was always available. We just had to figure it out. So anti-gravity has always been available. And it's not even, here's the really, here's the hard part. It's not like we have to figure it out. Think of like Mark Twain said, it's easier to bamboozle people than to convince them they've been bamboozled. Everyone's been bamboozled to think that anti-gravity hasn't been around since the 1800s. It's not it's that just like It's like, it's like um, George Carlin said, it's like a big giant club and you're not in it. Right. Everyone's I mean, like, well, why wouldn't they give us anti-gravity? Why would they give you anti-gravity? The people that have anti-gravity, why would they let you in the anti-gravity club? Because John Warner and Eric Heckard would have our anti-gravity special airplane. All right. Try to sell it to the public. And it's like, oh, no. Tours to the moon. <laughs> right. And by all accounts, <clears throat> you know, ancient pre-Diluvian high civilizations, Atlantis, Lemuria, Mu, Og, 
you know, Khmer and, you know, the Indus Valley civilizations, you know, they all had Vimanas. Yeah. And it's like, you know, if you read the Vedic texts, which, you know, the SS did in the Tula Society, you know, and mm -hmm. you can back engineer some of that if you have enough esoteric knowledge, which German philosopher scientists had in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason they had all those technical schools and chemical companies. Yeah. You know, um, the Sonora Aero Club, uh, the 1897 airships, you know, Walter Bosley does a great job in his books piecing that together. And I've read them and I, I put some of that into my new novel. And I thank him and Joseph Farrell for their information and, you know, others. Um, and so once you realize it's not that hard to cobble together something anti-gravity if you know the tricks, you know, it's like, you know, and I think, you know, everyone's mentioned that, you know, the, the crashed ET craft we get, you know, we turn away a lot of stuff in the trade. It's like, no, no, we got that model. We got 10 of those in the warehouse, you know, but we're really good like hot rodders on earth. You know, we can take, go to a junkyard, get an engine block and some other pieces and make a 200 mile an hour car for Bonneville out of junk. And that's apparently what we're doing with a lot of this technology. But, oh, the, those earth people, they're not such dimwits after all, you know, and, you know, pat ourselves on the back. All right. You know, but it's, it's, you know, it's the dirty laundry that everyone's, you know, they don't care. The deep state, the Pentagon, everybody, you know, the factions who are in charge of the black technology, they don't care that we talk about flying saucers and the grays, little gray aliens with big eyes, you know, and, and Star Trek and all that sci-fi stuff in Hollywood. They don't care about that. What they care about is the dirty laundry. And I've seen all my life, uh, politicians, senators, congressmen, you know, turn away from my questions. You know, they push the conversation sideways. They're like, well, you know, I ask them, you know, do ETs and you know, do we back engineer stuff in the military? And they're like, you know, it's interesting. And then they go off on a story and they push the topic sideways, like a politician does. And that doesn't work with me because I've grown up with my father. Oh, uh, well, son, uh, you know, I can't speak to that, but, you know, but get a few whiskeys in people in vino veritas. And they start flapping their gums on some things. Uh, can I tell a quick story? Yeah, go for it. All right. in, in regards to Carl Jung and synchronicity, mm -hmm. my grandmother, Mary Mellon, was a mystic. And she knew Carl Jung. She was a, a devotee of uh, Rudolf Steiner and Blavatsky. And she knew Manly P. Hall. Ooh, and uh, nice. my grandfather and her knew Carl Jung very well. So she knew all about that stuff. In fact, they created something called the Bollingen Foundation. But in 1963, you know, it was dissolved into the Andrew Mellon Foundation. And of course, you and I know big foundations just funnel cash into the deep state, black budgets. But anyway, um, synchronicity is a, it's an interesting concept. My wife and I see it all the time now. So five years, six years ago, we were at a, invited to a book signing party in DC. And it was this English guy and he wrote about Churchill. I thought the book was boring, but whatever. So we sit down at this uh, table and there's a couple across from us in their early 40s. And we just start chit-chatting. You know, we don't know each other. And the guy says, you know, I said, what do you do? You know, and he says, well, I work in the aerospace industry, you know, around town, contractors and stuff. And I said, oh, are you in the classified stuff? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, hmm, let me throw out a few terms and see if you and I are on the same page. <laughs> And I looked at him, I said, unified field theory. He nods, you know, anti-gravitics. Yep, he nods. And I said, you know, you, you know non-linear German physics. Yeah, you know, carbon fiber wrapped around a zero point energy plasma ring in a triangle shape. Yeah, very nice to meet you. And, you know, and that's the kind of thing that happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had a CIA guy call me up. He was in my, my old Cadillac club, right? And I was going to sell an old, one of my old shitty Cadillacs with tail fins and get another Cadillac. And so um, he comes out to my farm and we're just chit-chatting. He just sees the CIA blanket that's in, on my couch. And I said, well, my wife was a linguist, you know, for years at the CIA. And uh, yeah, MJ-12, <laughs> you know, she found that. 
It's on their server. You just can't access it. You need cosmic or queue clearance. But he starts, he and I start talking for five hours, like you and I did the other day, because he and I are on the same page. Now, he didn't know a lot of the stuff I knew, but when you find through synchronicity, when you find a kindred spirit that knows, you know, disclosure, uh, everything, ETs, other worlds, universes, uh, timelines, uh, temporal physics, you know, um, it's, it's a very small club of people. And by and large, most of the people want to talk about it because they're tired of being, you know, I was tired of being alone and, and you know, I'm lucky to have my wife with me who understands. That is most people don't, a lot of their spouses don't, they're like, you're crazy. And I, I'll bet a lot of people, your viewers know that feeling. It's a very lonely um, feeling. I, I feel for people, people reach out to me all the time um, just to make a connection. And they, well, I did. Oh so, yeah, so many <laughs> times they tell me. Foolishly I did. So many times they tell me that even they can't talk to their spouse about it. That breaks my heart, actually, to, to think that oh, like, here's this, that person that you can talk to everything else, but this one thing that means so much to this one person and the other person has no tolerance for that conversation is rough. Yeah, I have none of my good friends. Oof. Yeah. You know, and they're all middle-aged, but you know, now two of their sons came forward to me and said, gosh, do we have a moon base? And is there a secret space program? And, you know, I, I always say to people, I don't, I don't know anything for sure. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you need to trust your own mind, your own sixth sense. And, you know, don't listen to others, but what makes sense to you? If it resonates with yep. you, then you know, you're on the right track. And I say that, exactly. I said, maybe, I think that there's really something to all that stuff. And, um, and I should have said that at the beginning of the interview, you know, I, I, I wouldn't tell your viewers that, that, the stories I have, uh, you know, I'm not sure of anything. I, I can't, hardly can't get any documents, you know, everything. I have circumstantial evidence that people I've talked to, but that's just a story. Everyone's like, oh, he's lying. He never knew yeah. Bobby Ray Inman. And it's like, oh, come on. And he and my dad were best friends. Mm -hmm. um, and um, do you want me to tell the World War II story? Uh, which one was this? About my grandfather in the OSS. Oh, absolutely. I'm a big I'm a big fan of everything to do with the OSS. It's a big part of what I'm looking into. Um, Long Island was a massive repository of Operation Paperclip scientists and workers and stuff post-World War II. So yeah, anything to do with OSS, fire away. Yeah. So I've been researching my grandfather, Paul Mellon, for 25 years. And uh, I've scraped up bits and pieces along the way. Uh, I, I do have a, a CIA document that, that says he and Alan Dulles were at the Council of Foreign Relations meeting in New York in 1953, which proves they had an association, mm -hmm. uh, but you can't find it anywhere else. I have snippets from all those Marine Corps colonels and other people and generals and CIA and NSA people, DIA people, and ONI, my ONI Navy captain friend, who says, oh, yeah. You know, the Mellons have been deeply involved in national security issues going back to World War II and, and before. And so people can also research my shitty uh, great-grandfather, Andrew Mellon, who was Secretary of, Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury under Harding and Hoover and had a, a big hand with his robber baron pals with the Great Depression, his outdated policies. He was also ambassador to England in 1931. So he was chumming with the British royal family. But that's a whole other story. Um, in World War II, my grandfather uh, went from Fort Riley, Ka Kansas, being in charge of the saddlery, you know, because he was a horsey guy, horse guy, to being an OSS agent as a U.S. Army major. Well, he knew Julia Child and Carl Young and well, Bill Donovan and, and his brother-in-law, David Bruce, is another person people should research if they're into the OSS. Uh, who's my, my grandfather's brother-in-law, station chief of London. And Alan Dulles was station chief of Switzerland. And my grandfather bounced in between these two guys. And of course, Alan Dulles debriefed the, the Galen uh, SS information uh, intelligence unit on the Eastern Front, the Ost Front, and, um, you know, hired Nazis. You know, they knew the war was going to end, and they was like, well, look, let Mossad hunt a few, or let the, the Israelis hunt a few Nazis, but let's hire the rest, you know. And um, my grandfather told me one time when I was in my college years, he said, I, after his third martini, you know, 
I said, tell me about your experiences in the war. And he said, well, I trained French women to jump out of an airplane into France as OSS agents. Lucky dog. You know, he was married at the time, but, you know. And uh, he said, I worked for General Patton in 1945. And I said, oh, I you know, I, I knew a lot about General Patton. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I was there with him in the OSS in Czechoslovakia in 1945. And he said to me, he said, look, I, I, we went into with a hangar with the general uh, where the Germans had some exotic aircraft and other war weapons, you know, rocketry, you know, the usual rockets, uh, the guided rockets with the television cameras um other stuff and he said i saw you know a disc shaped aircraft and i said oh i remember reading about that it had bmw jet engines all around it and it didn't really work and he kind of laughed and he said no it wasn't that and the next thing i know we're eating dinner and and i go back to being a college student uh, and i forget that and then when i'm reading nick cook's book in 2004, the hunt for zero point, that got my attention. And all these pieces started to fall into place. And I thought, holy shit, you know, council, my grandfather was council for relations, the Jason Society. These aren't people that love humanity. The, the, the CFR lets nations starve. Oh, should we let this African nation starve? That's a great idea. I vote yes. You know, that's what they do. That'll teach them. Yeah. And, you know, he helped fund the CIA with his friend Nelson Rockefeller, you know, Alan Dulles and all those rich fat cats. They secretly funded the CIA and the NSA because you know, Congress was war weary and bankrupt. But of course, the, the banking fraud and other funding streams that were illegal, you know, no problem. Um, you know, and all these pieces start to fall together. And um, I'm pretty sure when I was a kid, I met Alan Dulles. The round glasses. I, I enjoyed Dulles Airport, which is named after his brother, it's down over here in Virginia. And we would leave from there all the time. It's a beautiful Saarinen design airport. And I remember being five years old and my grandfather saying, this is Alan Dulles, my friend. And those glasses and that cold thousand yard stare he has, that's my dim memory. My mother says she doesn't remember that, but I do. I have a really good memory. I remember stuff when I was two years old. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to your experience of us being kids. Anyway, that, that's why I think my grandfather was close to it, Majestic it, it, it makes me nervous for you hearing that you were in proximity to that man at that age. That's all. I'm right. Like, oh. So Jackie Kennedy and kids were family uh, uh, friends, and they would come to his beach house in Cape Cod every summer. Mm -hmm. Well, I sent you those pictures of John and Jackie Kennedy in 1959 at my grandfather's beach house. Now, why would a hardened... Republican, a friend of Alan Dulles, you know, an OSS member, and, you know, they were all the rich folks were chummy together. You know, the Kennedys are a committee of 300 family. And they were on, you know, not Joe Kennedy, he was a fascist, but, you know, the kids did pretty well. Um, you got to ask your question. I think, I think Paul Mellon, my grandfather, was very close to that he knew what was going on with the assassination, probably wasn't happy about it, but he knew it was best because it was the German aerospace scientists, as Joseph Farrell says in his books and his podcasts, plus the Texas oil men, plus LBJ, plus Alan Dulles, the CIA, everybody. There was a million people lined up around the block to kill Kennedy. German aerospace yeah. scientists. Uh, right. Like like, because like on Long Island, like Grumman that built the lunar module, yeah. Grumman. All the companies, all the German paperclip guys, because mm -hmm. Kennedy wanted to release the UFO file. He wanted to go, I think, we think, that he wanted to go to the moon with the Russians and shake it, shake things up up there. And the word is that the NSA were up on the moon in 1958, and the Germans were up on the moon probably during the war because they hitched a ride. What so do you, what do you gather the resistance was to that idea then of Kennedy working with the Russians to go to the moon to shake things huh. up? So by the definition of shake things up, what do you mean by shake things up? And Cooperation, what? number one. Okay, okay. Which the entire military industrial complex did not want. Okay. You know, uh, General LeMay, he probably, uh, he probably had a pistol on Kennedy a dozen times. He, they hated it with each other. But Kennedy wanted people 
close to him that would keep his enemies closer, hmm. which is why, you know, he fired Alan Dulles. Big mistake. You know, John Kennedy had his heart in the right place. Uh, he was a true light warrior in the sense of the Vedic sense, but he was rash. And of course, he got involved with Marilyn Monroe and a lot of loose women, which is not, you know, the best spies in the world are women. Uh, let's face that, going back forever. And so he did a lot of dumb things and he got killed for it. Mm -hmm. And I asked my dad, because he knew, my dad knew all three Kennedy brothers because Bobby Kennedy and my dad went to law school at UVA in the early 50s. So my dad knew all the Kennedys. And then when he married my mother in 1957, you know, they were all chummy in, in DC and in Cape Cod, everywhere. And I remember them growing up, you know. Um, and so it all starts, to, you know, it's a small world with all these committee of 300 families. And my, my dad married into it. He was a middle-class guy. His dad was a U.S. Army doctor in World War I and a gynecologist. You know, they were from middle-class stock. Nothing fancy. They were Stuart clan from Scotland, which some have said, you know, that's some of that Anunnaki royal bloodline, whatever you want to you know, say about that. You know, presumably committee of 300 members have more of that genetics. I don't know. Maybe makes sense, but that doesn't mean they're bad people, you know. It's good, but uh, so all these all these things, I'm, I'm I'm sort of all over the place. But all these things sort of fell together about ten years ago, and I just fell on the floor. I mean, you know, my wife was like, "Holy shit," you know. And it took her a while for me to explain all the pieces. But you know, as you know, coincidences are bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's synchronicity all points of space and time are connected things happen for reasons and then when chris mellon came out publicly in 2017 i knew i knew then they had picked a mellon to do that initiative for a reason and you know i've tried to be supportive of chris but you know he and elizondo and that tts thing they were lying to the american people by omission because even if five percent of the wild stuff is true it is mind-blowing mm -hmm and horrifying and i don't think chris ever wants i think they want to move it sideways you know slow it down you know maybe in 50 years the american people and you and i discussed this you know that's bullshit you, know, you and i know a lot of, of people i know a lot of blue collar people i really appreciate them mm -hmm. their heads aren't going to explode some people will end up licking windows and staying in bed over the shock of it all but come on we're selling the American people. I don't know about the people of the world, but the American people can handle it by and large. So that's a bullshit excuse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here I am today with you. This is my first interview by someone else. Thank you. As sir. a podcast. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know. I'm glad I'm you solution with the up. entire U.S. military. You know, Chris Mellon's telling lies. I, I can't stand for that anymore. You know, I, there needs to be another Mellon family voice out there publicly. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I have like Popeye ringing in my head. Like I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more. I feel like squeezing the, the spinach can open, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of your viewers are like, well, I don't trust this douchebag. You know, he's a Mellon family committee of 300. He's got an agenda. My only agenda is the same agenda as you and Simon Parks and Kerry Cassidy and Alex Collier and Penny and everybody. Yeah, there's and always there folks. We've got to come to terms with the hard stuff. Yep. There's now, bad stuff. Yeah, there's bad stuff going on, and we need to pull the veil back, shine the lights on, and, and just let everybody know what the real truth is. I mean, we've been bamboozled. It's that simple. We've been lied to. Um, look, like from your facts as a military historian, you can certainly say we've been oh. factually lied to about the military history of the world. Oh, forget that. How about the pyramids? You know, right? Exactly. The sand pyramids. You know, they, they're still saying they use slaves and oxen to do it. You know, it's it's obvious. There's a and there was an Arab guy who wrote in the 11th century and said, "Oh, I you know, the word is I got that the Egyptians had these giant uh, sort of carpet-like things, and they had those long copper scepters that looked like tuning forks. Mm -hmm. Well, they would bang the edge of the stone in a certain way, and they would start a vibration going." And uh, the stone would lift up a few inches and they would move it along. Basic anti-gravity movement. The guy tells you how they did it. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, you know, uh, he was smoking hashish or something. You know, uh, academia is corrupt to the core. Just because the person receiving this information can't 
imagine how to build said rod to get said function. Yeah, they were different they imagination and ability doesn't mean that that other person explaining what they saw didn't see what they saw. Right. If you take a, a long enough tuning fork mm -hmm. and bang it and put it on a, you know, a piece of pink granite, which is extremely hard or black granite. If there's a, a fissure, it, you can hear by the sound, it'll crack it. You know, I mean, this, a lot of this stuff isn't, they didn't have giant machines, you know, with spaceships. I don't think they had basic tools that the mystery schools obtained. And then the Freemasons obtained that to build cathedrals and star forts, which is another area of interest of mine, because mm -hmm. I think I'm the only military historian looking into that. I think that's Sacred a great geometry, cymatics, you know, I just started recently looking in that direction myself, because as a tradesman, I'm, I'm simply intrigued oh. by the massive, massive constructions that have occurred on my planet before me. And I'm keenly aware that the story that we're being told is shenanigans because it's just simply not true as presented. And they always have these genius architects, Van Cohorn and, uh, you know, Marquis de Vauvin, mm -hmm. you know, who all their miracle engineers and built all this stuff all over Europe. There's tens of thousands of star fortified cities, towns, and four actual forts just in Europe. Tons of them all over the world. I think there's like 11,000 so far, oh, and they geez. keep finding new ones every day. I had no idea. You know, there's just not enough surveyors and stonemasons and Freemasons right. and um, military architects and gunnery experts and uh, in, the, in those years to really... Right. That's one of the things that I've, that. I've suggested that to people. Have, I've suggested what kind of that. Technology were they using? That specific angle is that if all of these things were being built in the time periods that were being said, the labor pool required to be at all of these locations at once to be right. building all of this stuff is it's not happening. We're, we're being lied to. It, it just, I mean, if you go to Palmanova, Italy, mm -hmm. it's a reasonable sized town in a Nanagon, which is a nine sided. Uh, polygon with a, an octagon in the center and it has the biggest damn you know glacis walls uh point bastions ravelins uh, dry moat i've ever seen the bastions are 50 feet high that could stop modern tanks you know let alone 15th century cavalry and troops mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense it's like parking a two billion dollar aircraft carrier off of bar harbor maine to protect it Mm -hmm. You know, thank you for that. The bar harbor, yeah. Storms are coming, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you, but it doesn't make any sense. And that goes on and on and on. All the major cities of Europe, you know, were fortified with glacis walls. You can still see them. I found another one in, in Italy yesterday. Incredibly huge fortifications. For what? And then most of them never saw battle. But that's a whole that we should have a conversation just on that one day. Oh, we got we, this, the sky's I mean, the limit, I think, on the topics that you and I could engage on because you've you've seen quite a bit and you've pulled the veil back rather far. I don't want to, I, I don't ever come down on anyone in the disclosure movement. I think we should all join hands. I really do, as hard as that is. But a lot of people get out there and they talk about mud floods and Tartaria and star forts and they they don't know their history, even the military history. I urge people to read some books. First of all, they never show you architectural schematics with measurements, just sketches of completed fortifications or siege trenches. I read all the books in French too. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, um, but you have to know the parts because this is a clue. Ravelins, glacis walls, uh, bastions, you know, canals, you know, all the hydraulics associated with star forts a lot of the time. If you don't understand that, and in the different books, they're called different things. So even the authors didn't get them right. Mm -hmm. Something stinks here. And I said, why would you have cannons pointing at each other on, on an adjoining bastion? Oh, well, grape shot and canister. And I said, well, that's not, that's not a good idea either. It's your fellow troops. In fact, that's even worse. <laughs> so that's a, I don't want to go down that tangent because I know we need to talk about Long Island. Oh, it's all good. It's all good, John. I, I, I enjoy watching you freeform your thoughts. It's a beautiful yeah. thing. He's a maniac. What, what's wrong with him? No, no. This is, this is, this is how we function. I, in the you and I think the same. Is that you have to let me know what you're an expert in. I have to let you know what I'm an expert in. And we start making connections and well, getting this to figure, figure it I out. I don't like to use 
I well, don't like to use the word expert, but how about this? Experienced. I'll change yes, that. I've studied a lot. Experience, and, what you're experienced in and what I'm experienced in, and we make connections. Yeah, I've seen a lot of these fortifications all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, before I even knew what they were and all about, but you have to look at it as a worldwide whole and to see the satellite images to really get an idea of the sacred geometry and the beauty and the stunning harmony and beauty. It's incredible. But you're right. I, I Things stick in my head. My wife calls me the sponge, Senor Sponge. That's funny. Um, I forget that what that is in Spanish, you know. And my dad calls me Mister Know It All. You know, you remember Sherman, and that was before your time in the '60s. We were all programmed by cartoons. Yeah, you know, yeah. Johnny Quest was my favorite. Okay, Johnny Quest's dad was a military contractor, and his yeah. mother was was an heiress. <laughs> and Race Bandit was his bodyguard. I'm like, gosh, that's my parents called me Johnny Quest when I was a kid because I was always getting in trouble and burning yeah. things up, blowing them up mm -hmm. with gunpowder. There you go. God damn it. My dad would come out the, the bamboo's on fire again. That damn kid. They made the show. Oh, I was creating a zero point energy generator, Dad. Sorry. Die Glocke. Good stuff. I'll show up. No, no, no. It's all good. I think um, this is a, a huge part of what I'm trying to do in the community is to get everybody to um, respect. Um, I, I do. I, I use the term that I'm an expert in my own me. Like I'm an expert in my life. Yeah. So I throw that term around pretty loosely because that's my expertise is in me. And I want to empower other people uh, to feel like an expert of themselves just to share their experience and be empowered and say, you know what? I don't, I don't necessarily have all of the answers, um, but what no one can take from you, John, is your experience. You know, they may not like what you're saying. They may want to question it. They may want to throw stones at it. But what care, they, I won't apologize for anything. Right. What they can't tell you or prove is that that didn't happen. Right. You may not be able to prove that it did happen, but they can't prove it didn't happen. I mean, why would I lie? I'm yeah, not trying no. to monetize my YouTube channel. You know, I'm, yeah, I, yeah, you I know, I'm a millionaire. I admit it. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're trying to get more likes. You know, the melon money is blood money. I know that. You know, my great grandfather was a fascist. My grandfather was a fascist. I mean, my dad's a questionable politician. You know, I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I still, you know, I like the good parts, the good factions of the Navy and Marines. You know, not the black projects, not the stuff, not the people that put you through the ringer, certainly, right? Or others. I hold them damn well accountable. But, you know, at, at a certain point, we're going to have millions of people accountable. We're, what kind of courts and justice are we going to get you know the, the law is for protects the system and corporations and yeah and rich not. people it doesn't protect the common citizen yes correct that's that's a hard one I, that's the last five years when i've studied maritime admiralty law mm -hmm. jordan maxwell does a good job with all that and it's like you know the law doesn't protect the common person correct it's disgusting i i will and, tell you uh, um you know, I'm American. I believe in the Constitution. With no disrespect, I, I really appreciate that you're coming from your angle to share with me and the community because I would say that I, I learned about that disparaging, or I shouldn't say that, not disparaging, the discrepancy uh, back into 1994 when I got into the plumbing industry. And I started getting into those communities on the North Shore, and it was really, it was really, like, mind-opening to see the difference in the worlds that we wake up to seriously. Right. And I was like, okay, I, I'm understanding. I didn't like it, but I was learning a new truth um, that there is a, a wealthy way to the world and the laws and how they're applied. Um, and wealthy folks wake up to a different world than the common folks. 100%. I've seen it. It's hard. It's, it's actually hard to explain. I don't really discuss what I saw in the North Shore of Long Island with most folks, because um, they look at me like your friends look at you like, oh, wacky Warner, you know, he's, he's talking crazy stuff. You know, I get the same thing from my friends. When I tell them what I saw in the mansions, they think I'm making stuff up. Yeah. It's a weird I mean, world. What, what my forlorn hope is, is, you know, I can only speak for the, the wealthy people that I know and have met. Mm -hmm. Most of these people are very benign people who believe in, in the Constitution and justice. They give to millions to foundations thinking they're helping people in Africa or, you know, disadvantaged people in the United States. They really care. 
a lot of these people. It's just that 10% that's fascist. That's my rule, but that, that's what I think is going on. That's all they need. Mm -hmm. And I think a, the reason there's not more people like me and Laura Eisenhower is that they're scared shitless. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that do know something are like, oh my God, I don't want to lose my money. The, the deep state will take away my bank account. You know, uh, and that, you know, but enough is enough. I mean, human trafficking and uh, the problems with pedophilia and children and missing children and all that, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I, I hope that I inspire some of the, my peers in that realm. Um, you know, people that, you, know, you and I have worked nine to nine jobs in our lives. I've, mm -hmm. I've always had a good work ethic. My dad made me work and I enjoyed it. And I love working with people and working with my hands. But a lot of these rich people have never worked a five, nine to five job in their lives. And they're very insulated with their wealth and they only hang around with wealthy people. Mm -hmm. They don't have a mix of friends like I've always had. I kind of hated my whole lineage. I, the, the rich kids were always preppy and snotty and you know, I thought they were assholes. They weren't <laughs> looking to build engines with you for sure. No, they, you know, I was always an outcast. And, but a lot of these people are not evil. Um, they have really good hearts. They think they're doing good by giving away their money. Their money is, I, I tell them, your money is not going where you think it is. The world is not ordered like you think it is. Our whole reality is not what you think it is. Mm -hmm. But they're scared to hear that. Mm -hmm. But the disclosure movement as a whole is a cross-section of society all over the world. Mm -hmm. Now, not a lot of rich people will come forward because a lot of people say, well, they're the problem. That's the Illuminati that's the 1%. They're at the top of the pyramid with the all-seeing eye. They're with the Pindar. You know, they're in, in line with the Draco and the Anunnaki and, and the Queen of England. And it's like, um, no. My grandfather may have been when he maybe dated QE2. They were sure fond of each other. She, she stayed with him at his farm in Virginia many, many times. I remember. And, but that's not me. And that's not others. And it's certainly not the you know, two or three people I know in my family, uh, my cousins and things, mm -hmm. that are 30% on board with what you and I are talking about. They're getting there, but slowly. Mm -hmm. So one of the tactics, this goes back to the Anunnaki, who created a caste system in Sumeria. You know, the darker skinned people did the hard work in the fields under the sun. Uh, the brown people tended the shops and merchants. And the white skinned people serviced their overlords sexually and also uh, tended to the gardens and temples. And that caste system has come down today. And one of the ways to keep the little people from fighting against their true masters in the shadows is to divide them by race, religion, caste. You know, there's still a caste system in India overtly. Um, and in, you know, there is in the military rank. Officers enlisted, yep. you know, yep. goddamn those brass hats, you know, they keep that tension going so they don't, you know, and the American people are at each other's throats, you know, and it's all this caste system that goes all the way back to Sumeria and the Anunnaki. Yep. And it, the disclosure movement is a caste system. You've got the messiahs like Stephen Greer, who don't believe in negative aliens. I, I don't understand what happened to him. Richard Dolan is scared now. He used to be groundbreaking. And they all bicker and hate one another. Everyone hates Kerry Cassidy, you know, the, the other messiahs. Well, the, you know, except for Simon Parks, Alex Collier, and a few others. You know, it's all divided up, and that's by design. Mm -hmm. It's like the CIA uh, infiltrated MUFON back in the 90s. Oh, yeah, talk about UFOs. It's always the hardware. You know, Chris Mellon, Elizondo. Well, we don't know what these craft are. Or who pilots them? They they always you notice that mm -hmm. they always the, the official them always promotes the hardware angle. Mm -hmm. You know, let alone that these a lot of craft come into our atmosphere and all of a sudden they're out of fifth density and they're in third density, and that set of third density physics doesn't apply to them and they spin in. Mm -hmm. So nobody ever talks about that. You know, the U.S. Navy has every single craft. <laughs> Like you and I know our Ford Mustangs mm -hmm. and muscle cars, every model, every feature, every option. They know everything and everyone piloting those crap. And if yeah. they don't, their ET advisors say, oh, I know those guys. Yeah, you better keep an eye on them. They're going to steal all the McDonald's hamburgers and you better 
keep an eye on your turnips, you know, and that's how it works. There are and many people that know exactly like people hinting at all that. They're like, well, you know, one retired Marine Corps guy said, you know, listen, ETs walk the whole Pentagon every single day and they look exactly like us. You know, the they, could, they can put a holographic image out or they really do look, look like us, like some of the Nordic types do. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard that, I was like, oh, man, I can't quite, you know, this is 25 years ago. But of course, you know, in a couple of years, I was, you know, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Because everyone, you know, we're, we're brainwashed to think it's us versus them out there. You know, we're all equal citizens of the cosmos. We're different. Mm -hmm. But nobody's better or worse than anyone else. You know, everyone's sort of neutral. This good and evil is a, a, is a relative comp like, concept. You know, the Sufis, you know, are like, you know, everyone's cool, man. But, you know, you're either positive or negative or anything in between, any vibration in between. And so there's this, oh, what are they invading? You know, you're, you know, I believe that we are, human beings on Earth are a product of 22 different star races, their genetic programs including the Anunnaki one. Mm -hmm. That was one of 22. The Aborigines, I think, and the Eskimos might have been a separate deal, but I'm not sure. A lot of people think that everyone on Earth has Anunnaki genetics. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be an expert in that conversation, but I definitely think the, um, the hybridization, I think, oh, yeah. it's common. pretty yeah. evident to me when you look at what we are doing on this planet as, as human beings compared to all the other things on this planet and what they're doing. It seems like we're distinctly different, and it's not just a simple. Darwinian evolution is a joke. I knew that back in high school. I, I, yeah. I said, Darwin, this, we're not from apes. Proto-humans and Neanderthals are not human. Understood, they yeah. No. They do not pack the gear for speech or higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, you know, missing link will be found, and then they never found they're it. They're going to find it because there is no link. They, they, they come out every few years with a new proto-human bone they found in Africa. And they're like, look, we think we're on the, we're on the, you know, they push the conversation sideways. Mm -hmm. When it's obvious to everyone, you know, the elongated skulls. I mean, come on. These are different species of humans back in the day. Mm -hmm. Maybe today. I don't know. Who did you work with in Antarctica? Any elongated skull people? I didn't see any elongated skull folks. But um, one of the things that was... Um you and I have pretty tall foreheads, I, yeah, but we're uh, not smart enough. Yeah, we're half an idiot. I hide mine under my headphones. <laughs> yeah, those but, guys, um, don't worry about those two guys. They're idiots. I think it might have been Rex on the Leak Project that asked me. I can't remember, but he, it was a good point. And, you know, at the, I was not as awakened when I was at the South Pole. I wish I had the brain that I do now when I was there. Um, well, you might have gotten in trouble. It's yeah, it's a possibility too. Um, well, that would have been fun too. <laughs> or I might have got wiped anyway. <laughs> yeah, but um, what I hadn't really dawned on me was um, now looking back, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of folks that are at the South Pole Station, covered head to toe in cold weather gear. You never see one bit of their skin. I mean, seriously, if you're gonna have an intergalactic space station. Holy cow. Yeah. You'd be walking right past me. I'd have no idea if you got two more arms under your parka or I don't know. But yeah. people come and go constantly and they just pass you in the hallways and I don't know. Well, if you heard that story out um, at the Nellis Range in uh, north of Las Vegas, the Area 51 whole complex where the tall whites were kept uh, since the 1960s and they used to dress them up and bring them into Vegas for a steak dinner and you know, pale skin and sunglasses, but nobody noticed. There you go. Same thing about, uh, what was that, Pleasantville, California? They said that that was a directed energy weapon strike, and that because there were a lot of tall whites who were coming out and mingling with everyone huh. and going, hello, how are you? <laughs> you know, we want to mingle and be part of your society. And someone said, some deep state faction said, um, no, and they pushed the button, huh. and Pleasantville went up like a, like a, you know, a welder's torch. Interesting. That's a story I heard. It uh -huh. makes sense to me, but. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that there's something went weird in California. They we're all made of stardust. I mean, who's an ET? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, our cousins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even the Anunnaki. I mean, they're our cousins. Sorry, it's the country cousins, as I call them, but, mm -hmm. you know, they're our cousins. Get over your puny self, is what I tell people. And they just laugh and walk away. Yep.
Yep. We which have. I, I don't think there's any way to red pill anyone. No. They have to have an awakening process for that for you to give them any kind of information or steer them in a direction. But but folks that are asleep, no no way. Yeah, I just I look at it like I'm just throwing out little bits of cheese for people, and if they want to bite on it, I'll give them a little bit more. But if they're not going to bite, I'm not going to bother. Right. You know. There's, you know, someone channeled an ET, and they said, "Oh, you have to red pill people. You have to try." And it's like, yeah, you good luck. As they say in Vermont, "Oh, sure, bud." You know, it's not going to work. That's my experience. I, I've I've talked to Harvard professors who are friends of mine, CIA people, and I'm like talking about these higher concepts and, you know, and they just was like, huh? Well, first and foremost, lots of times nowadays, you'll never get somebody to change their mind when they literally have a vested interest in that position. Yeah. So it's first and foremost, like if, if that's going on, you're not going to change their mind because you're not going to, unless you can refund their world, they're going to just yeah. stick with the opinion that sticks with their funding. Right. You might get people under 30 which is my experience as well, uh, because they're more open-minded. They're not fully programmed yet, mm -hmm. but they're getting there mm -hmm. uh, with all the ma media and the movies and, and, and everything, religion, mm -hmm. everything, you know. Uh, but the over 40 crowd, a few yep. here and there that, are, that have probably chosen in their soul contract, you know, in their reincarnation, their former lives, and said, uh, oh, what do you want to do in the next life? And you and I were like, hmm, I'm going to check this box and this option box and this. And then, oh, you're in for it. Well, I don't care. You know, I want an action-packed thriller. Yeah. And you know, I don't oh, know about you. Oh, been here at the South Pole. You sure about that? Oh, yeah. I've been through the dark night of the soul. I, I won't go there. You know, it's private. But, man, mm -hmm. I was like, maybe I shouldn't have ticked all those option boxes in this life. You know, no, I'm getting sick. And physically sick and you know when you talk about human trafficking and all that that's disgusting mm -hmm. it is lower than low mm -hmm. and all the ets involved with it are just you know i know i know duality yin and yang you know the, the universe is polarity you have to understand from all perspectives and i'm get that you know you and i might have been nazi soldiers in our last lives you know we might have been cowboys genociding you know the sioux indians with custer you know, I'm not a saint. I, you know, I have a bloodthirsty side, you know, but I stopped hunting and doing all that stuff, you know, with guns. I, I, I just shoot targets now. I, I don't hunt anymore because I, I taken the Buddhist view. I, all life is precious, but I understand, you know, I understand that because I have a bloodthirsty side. Um, it's balanced out by my good side, my funny side, but, um, my loving side, like everyone has, duality. I would but, imagine you know, it gives you, you know, more depth. It gives you, you know, more depth to Nazis, your... You know who they are. I mean, they're dark people. Their energy is dark. It gives you, you more know? depth to your perspective now, having gone down the path that you did to have the appreciations that you have for life. Having taken a life before gives you more of an appreciation for it technically now. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I'd like to tell one story. I didn't think I was going to say this, but you know what? What the fuck? Go for um, it. I was failing out of school at 13, mm -hmm. my religious school at the National Cathedral. And my dad, in those days, had a bit of an ego on him, and uh, he was a little short-sighted. I was living with him, and alone, you know, we were alone, the housekeeper. And he said, you need a tutor. So what does the guy do? Well, at my school, there was a teacher that was feared over all others. He was a Vietnam vet. He was a Green Beret. And man, did he had seen a lot of action. He was the darkest individual. No offense to vets. This was a, the only vet I know, I've known that isn't a good person. And he had suffered some horrible PTSD. So he's living with us now, tutoring me. He has a Vietnamese wife. He beat her every night, screaming. He drank all my dad's liquor. And he yelled and screamed and pushed me into walls and shook me by the lapels and, and you know, uh, Scared the living shit out of me. And I'm 13 years old. And my dad's off traveling. Mm -hmm. I'm in the house with this psychopath. You know, and I understand PTSD. I do the wounded vet deer hunt at my farm twice a year for these guys. I've talked to them at length. 
they're amazing people, but this guy had lost his mind. Mm -hmm. And that was my first dark night of the soul. And after a couple months of that, I ran away and I ran and I found my mother and I said, my God, get, get me to boarding school. And they, they lifted me out of school, sent me to boarding school to get away from this guy. And she tore my dad a new asshole. Mm -hmm. well, my mother's a hippie and she got me into UFOs and alternate, you know, don't trust the government. <laughs> mm -hmm. That took me a while, but, you know, she was right. You know, Vietnam's a sham. Gulf of Tonkin, mm -hmm. you know, LBJ. Oh, yeah, yep, yeah yep. my mom's a lot of And uh, she was right. And so that was a dark experience. I forgive my dad. He, he just, he thought he was doing a good idea. It was a stupid idea. He made a mistake. And he made a mistake. But this is a big mistake for a 13-year-old kid. And this guy oh, was for sure. a psychopath. I could guarantee your father didn't intend for it to go that way. You know, he had a loaded M16, his service weapon, underneath the bed. Yeah. I know because I pulled it out and I knew what an M16 was at 13. Mm -hmm. Because my dad had taught me to shoot an M1 Grand when I was 11. Mm -hmm. So I knew guns and I knew what it was. You don't keep a loaded M16 in the house where they've hired you to, to live with them. And that, that was madness. And maybe my dad agreed to the weapon. I, maybe so. I, 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 you know what it is? I, it's so funny. I could see both sides of the story technically, right? I get yeah, your and, angle. I totally so get your dad, angle. But from his perspective, he could probably justify saying, listen, I don't go anywhere for the rest of my life without my weapon. Well, he didn't. And he, could be, and he could be justified from his life experience to perceive life that way. No, I understand that. The 68, the 1968 riots, we were in Georgetown at my house. And my dad and uncle got on their roofs with their bandoliers of ammo and their M1s. Mm -hmm. Now, the riders didn't make it to Georgetown. I, the whole thing made me sad. I remember they sh we were on, you know, near the cathedral and they, they showed us the smoke rising. Mm -hmm. They said, This is Martin Luther King died. And it, we all cried when we were six years old. So I remember that whole episode, another piece of history I remember. And my dad said to me, I never want to shoot anybody. We're going to try to scare people away without hurting them because mm -hmm. they don't want to shoot anybody, even though yeah. they've been for, you know, Korean War veterans, mm -hmm. combat veterans. Yeah. So, you know, but I understand my dad doing that, but he didn't realize this guy had PTSD. They didn't understand it back then. Battle fatigue. You know, they didn't know what to call it. But this guy, you know, I, I forgive him, too, because he's mentally ill. And the weird thing was I met a, a racing driver years later in California who said, um, did you know this guy? And I said, yeah. And he's like, he's the headmaster of my school. And I said, let me guess. Everyone hates him. He's like, how did you know? I said, the guy lived in my house for a year. He's, he's a Vietnam vet, a Green Beret, who saw way too much action. Maybe he saw some UFOs taking away MIA bodies. That would, you know, I've talked to some vets who have seen that kind of stuff. Ooh, I've never even heard of that before. Oh, yeah. Human, all, remember Syria? Oh, there's 150,000, you know, missing. The dead and then there's the missing. Why well, didn't, the, I've never, I've never heard of okay. anything like this. Where did the missing go? In wars throughout history. Yeah. They're taken for genetics. That's part of the agreement. War is a mass death ritual. Understood. That part I can totally follow, but it never, it never, I never had this shot fired across my bow that there's actually a lot of people that go to war and then simply just go missing. I know there's like, you know, POWs, MIA. I know some people go missing in war and some get killed. Like, but I was always thinking like one or two people get lost in the jungle, but you're making it out like, no, 150,000 people just disappear is totally different right. than where my brain was at. Where do they go? Didn't know they left. I've learned this maybe seven years ago. And okay. I, God almighty. Um, and then once you start to realize that this is all a Babylonian death ritual, like a Bohemian Grove kind of thing, you know, you sacrifice either children or, you know, soldiers. But more like nation states just sending in sacrifices to something right. else other than there being an actual need for conflict. That's what I think the wars okay. are. I can follow it's, that. I didn't come to that on my own. I read that from some other people who have pieced that together. But with my own experience, I, I've talked to vets and things, and they're like, there's a guy on my forum, you know, he's anonymous, but he said, look, I was in Nam, and my ranger unit, we lost 360 people. And I said, what, to fire? And I, he said, no, they disappeared. And I said, were UFOs involved? And he's like, oh, yeah, I've seen a million of those things in Nam. And what I've heard is the Greys were doing experiments underground. Wow. And other ET groups. Because, you know, genetics, dead or alive, is very valuable out in the cosmos because that's like a commodity. 
forget gold and chocolate and heroin and Ford trucks, mm -hmm. everything in you know, spaceships that they send out there, you know, Alcoa aluminum, the Mellon family, you know, that all goes out to space as trade, trade goods, I believe. Mm -hmm. But the biggest trade goods, this is, this is the dirty laundry the military industrial complex doesn't want you to know. Yep. And I'm going to say it, I'm going to call spade like spade, is that we trade people dead or alive. Yep. Preferably alive, but war dead, not a problem. Because not only, you know, Penny can speak to that. Mm -hmm. the super soldiers have seen it. You can reanimate dead bodies within a certain time period. Mm -hmm. But also, it doesn't matter if they're dead. You can just splice body parts or genetics, and you can, uh, you know, a race of extraterrestrials living on a very strong sun planet, you know, they have to live underground. But in a few generations with Earth and maybe some other ET genetics, they've improved the race enough so that they have the skin to withstand all that radiation, things like that. Oh, well, now we're taller, we're healthier. I've actually because heard. Every, yeah, Earth is a garden planet. It's full of experiments. You know, everything was brought life. here. It's everything was brought life. here and nurtured. I've heard someone give justification. They said that the, the reason that we're all bamboozled is simply we're all that rich in the cosmos. When you look outwardly in the cosmos, wherever your house sits right now, you're infinitely wealthy in the cosmos. If, a, if an alien wanted to come to your property and make a business deal with you, I've been told that any mating pair of anything is basically of the greatest value in the cosmos. And from what people off planet would give you for that, for here, you'd be the richest thing here. And that's what this is all about. Is that the, the royal bloodlines? The off worlders would give us anything for everything, or you know, and we have so much here to give um, that it really it's just um, it's it's management. It's just you know other people not letting you in on the big game and not letting you know that it's going on. That you know, hey, technically you can do your own CE five event, draw down an intergalactic vessel, and get into uh, an import export deal. Yeah, be careful who you draw in. I get it. Greer style CE5. I it get it. But that's a, that's a reality that we are in that are there are other people trying to make sure you're not aware of that. Yeah. I mean, this is the They, want, they want all the business. Yeah. Because the, the business is happening, the exchange is going on. It's just you're not in the club. Yeah. For the last 12,000 years, basically, mm -hmm. you know, this is what the business of the royals and elites have been into, you know, thank you, Anunnaki, mm -hmm. is like, oh, you want to you be the richest guy in the world? No problem, you know? And you enter into this deal with the devil, basically, because the black market trade I've read and heard from people is a fourth density, third density deal. Once you're fifth density, you don't need to engage in black markets or illegal genetics or anything. You're above all that. Mm -hmm. You're a benevolent. You're a higher vibrational being. Mm -hmm. It's all the low lowlifes, pirate scum, mercenaries, and ne'er-do-wells in our galaxy, you know, engaging in this black market. And, of course, Earth is one of the hotspots. We're near, you know, Antarctica has a giant stargate, but we're near another stargate that has a lot of traffic coming in from other galaxies. I think Penny Bradley said something about that. Mm -hmm. And Alex Collier said that years and 20 years ago. And, you know, we're a hot spot. A lot of people come here for a vacation. A lot of ETs come here to plant, you know, lotus flowers. Ooh, how's our experiment going? Oh, all right, you know, let's have a pina colada. And a lot of them hear weapons trading and doing the dark stuff, mm -hmm. you know. But mo I think most ETs have done biological experiments on Earth for the good of the planet and us. You know, I don't like, you know, camel spiders in the denners that suck your face off but i understand it's a it's a you know everything every life form is sacred it has a soul every atom has a soul every star has a soul hmm. you know it's when you start you can't just go into the disclosure stuff and read about ufos and, and the horrible stuff I, I urge people to deal dig into metaphysics and philosophy and oh yeah Sufi wisdom and all that because then you know why yes why do uh, some of the benevolence, why do they have hermetic law and cosmic law and the law of one, which I believe in? It's because, you know, 
you have to allow without the darkness how would you appreciate the light i agree with that 100 percent. right if we didn't have the nazis in the holocaust in world war ii how, how much would people appreciate that we, you know, sort of won the war? The Nazis escaped. Um, back, but back when I was on Long Island, um, doing running around doing service calls as a plumber, no heat, you know, leaking this, blah, blah, blah. Every time I would show up to somebody's house, I, I had to understand um, I'm, I'm fixing people. When I, when I transitioned from being an apprentice to a, a mechanic and running out, one of the guys I trained under, he turned to me and said, you know, you have to not be nervous when you go into these homes. You know how to do the plumbing. That's not your problem anymore. You have to learn to fix the people. So I was always showing up. It was like it was somebody's worst day of their life. And I would have to um, engage them and talk them down. And, geez, I forget where I was going with this. Where, where were you just at where I jumped in? I lost my place now. You don't remember? You didn't talk? <laughs> I lost. I lost my place right mid thought. I had started with black that. Hawk, helicopter. Yeah, I went. I went too far off the mark. I'm you sorry for interrupting. Off the reservation, Mister. Right. It's that um, cloaked black triangle up there. You know, listening in on it. These two guys are idiots. But we better silence that part. We probably won't remember this interview. What interview? Yeah, you know, I, I forgot What's to mention like, the front end of the video that um, I, I thought we weren't going to get connected today. I thought we were going to actually, I was like, oh, great, here we go. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. My O&I friend turned me in, that son of a bitch. Yep, but you know, um, we actually have been talking for quite a bit, John, and I don't want to keep you forever. So um, if it's getting too long in the tooth in the conversation, you just no, let it's up me to know. You. It's up to you because, um, you know, we'll do another one, but, you know, it's up to you time-wise uh, you want to talk about long island do you want to touch upon that before we go is, is there yeah absolutely is there anything okay. um from like your experience because now i know um you you've actually been to long island as well um you do study oss stuff and if i remember correctly you said you got your pilot's license on long island yes in iceland okay uh, i lived uh, near sag harbor for four or five months and got my pilot's license mm -hmm. um in my 20s i was I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I wasn't a writer. I, I was a racing driver, sort of, mm -hmm. in my mid-20s. And I thought, maybe I'll go in the Coast Guard. I had my commercial diver's license. And I didn't do that. And then I was thinking, well, I'm going to be a commercial pilot like my brother-in-law. So I got my license and instrument rating, but that didn't go anywhere. But I lived on Long Island. Uh, I had several girlfriends when I lived in New York City who lived in Long Island. I had a, I have a great appreciation for it. Uh, it's a beautiful place. You know, you got to love... Camp Siegfried with all the Nazis in the 1930s who were into Tibetan Bon rituals, which were the animistic uh, faith of the Bon people of Tibet, you know, Agartha, inner earth people, and animals and tree spirits, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. Why were the Nazis into that? Hmm. I wonder, you know, mm -hmm. that's all related to the Tula Society and the Brill Society. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you want to be in the SS, you got to know all that stuff. And so why was the American Nazi party on Long Island? Well, as you and I know, I've been to Camp Hero, I've been to Montauk. And so, and that's a horrible, horrible bit of history that, you know, I'm really actually really sad when Americans finally start to understand that programs, those monarch solutions programs and, and other things, it, that's gonna be a really elephant pill to swallow. But that point of Long Island was a sacred place even to the Native Americans. It's got to be a vortex or a crossing of ley lines, I think. Mm -hmm. I, th I presume. I presume, too, because Tesla nodal. built his facility there. And right. So it's it probably a nodal, several nodal points for the crossing of ley lines, and ley lines run across tectonic plates. Now, this is telluric energy, electromagnetic energy that runs underground, which is how the Union Pacific Railroad telegraph lines worked. They hired U.S. Army geomancers. And geomancy is the art of, you know, divining rods and finding these pathways. And that's how you can find a well with divining rods because you're looking for water running underground, which is electromagnetic. Running water is electromagnetic. And that gets into the Starfort phenomenon, canals and other things. But so that tip of Long Island is extremely energetic. There's probably a vortex there, which Montauk and Brookhaven labs are probably right on top of. Mm -hmm. You use that energy. You know, and, um, you know, going back to prehistoric, maybe in pre-Diluvian societies, you know, that place was probably always, you know, was there a Stonehenge type deal going on there? You know, 
20,000 years ago? Probably. You know, portals, stargates, you know, probably is my guess. And Brookhaven Labs is, is what? An artificial portal of stargate, right? That's the, More that's or less. The they, they got the power supply to play with it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it all starts to make sense when you somehow you get after years and years, you accrued enough knowledge that all of a sudden you're like something that you thought was ridiculous 10 years ago. You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. You're like, now that's the only thing it can be. Right. Because you understand, uh, you know, my limited understanding of temporal physics and portals and stargates and wormholes and non-locality and, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, the universe is, you know, quarks and strings and, and you know, it, it's, it's a little over my head too. I'm not a quantum physicist. I don't have uh, to have all of the answers to know that I have really solid questions. Right. And the really scary thing is you and I both know and Penny knows and all the other people is that the U.S. military and all the militaries in the world who are involved in this black technology, mm -hmm. we're using this quantum physics technology without the spiritual component. Mm -hmm. We're the little kids with firecrackers, you know, yeah. sticks of dynamite, 10-year-old kids with sticks of dynamite and no wisdom, very little wisdom. That's what I look at the problem with a lot of these programs. Changing. I think that's slowly changing. I hope it is. Yeah. I hope so too, is that they can they can now no wisdom. Uh, You're like, oh, is it good militarily? Fuck yeah, we'll use it. Oh, but we lost two hundred ch children in this time tunnel to test. That mm -hmm. get two hundred more. Yeah. Get some of those navy guys from that sub. Yeah, they'll do it. Yeah, that's it. He tested because really well. <laughs> we'll blank this blank slate them for the next twenty years. Hate when now, that happens. The the ETs who have come up with this conquering of star systems and planets with the 20 in back and, and mercenary forces and mind control. And you know, they've been doing this for millions and maybe billions of years. Exactly. They've got it down pretty well. Yep. Create an elite monarchy on a planet, create alcohol to mess people up and create a portal in their brain. Evil spirits. You know, that's where spirits come from. Mm -hmm. You know, liquor. And uh, and it's so interesting game. to me that angle that you have on that, like as if it was made as a as a horrible thing for us to put it was, against us. By all accounts, it was given to us low alcohol beer by the Sumerians, or the Anunnaki, oh. because it's part of the control system. You have okay. religion, you you institute a centralized government, mm -hmm. bars, alcohol, drugs to a minor extent, but alcohol is the big one. You know. Remember our parents smoking and drinking, you know, oh, you kids and your drugs. And I'm like, really? You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and pot is the least toxic of anything. It, you know, in moderation, it's a good thing. You know, yep. it's, it's nonsense. And it all stems from that. It's, it's that sort of Draco reptilian, you know, Jason Rice says that in one of his interviews, he says, it's not that hard. You go in, you send some ground forces in, you, you deal with them for a few years, you gain their trust, you send a squad of the baddies in, you barely defeat them, so you become heroes, and then what do you do? They're beholden to you, you're gods to them, you know, uh, you institute centralized government, religions, mm -hmm. you know, keep them caste systems, racial caste systems, you know, an elite society. <laughs> kind of thing you know probably royalty. Cool. i think it was in the in the and out you know and then all that stuff and it works like a flipping charm there was an island in the pacific front during world war ii i can't remember the name of it but we went in there in mass to they had never seen anyone off their island before and we went in there airport Airplane. blah 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 and then we left after a very short period of time without really explaining anything and we were gone for a very long time. And then we went back and found that these people were worshiping right. soldiers that it, had shown up. It's called a cargo cult. Cargo cult. Okay. Yeah. And yes, it's the same type of thing. Um, you go to a planet that's, you know, hey, man, these guys are cool, you know, but they're, they're around, you know, the year 1200 for us. And you come in with your fancy gear and everything. And they're like, oh, wow, gods. You know, I mean, uh, Von Daniken, Chariot of the Gods. Mm -hmm. You know, what are people getting on their knees and praying to, giving up their power to? Mm -hmm. What God? You know, I was questioning that at 11 years old. I mean, what God? Get on my knees? God hates me? They would say, God hates you, John Warner. 
you better pray and you know, Jesus loves you. And I'm like, who's Jesus, man? It sounds like a used car salesman. You know, he was preaching more than likely if Jesus did exist. I'm not sure if he did. But if he did, he was preaching the law of one, not the one true God. You're making Maybe me laugh in my head. You, wisdom. Yeah. You're giving me flashbacks to, to grammar school. And I can totally imagine, I can totally hear a teacher saying something as awesome as, God hates you, John Warner. And that's what oh, people don't understand is God. going on in their schools. The teacher shook me and threw me up against the wall. <laughs> God like, hates you, John Warner. <laughs> like, how dare you take the Lord's name in vain? You know, I, and, and he said, you know, God will punish you. You're going to go to hell and, you know, you're going to, you and the devil are like this. And I'm like, I, I don't like God or the devil. It sounds, doesn't sound like dudes I want to hang out with, man. And they were like, shook me harder. Huh. I mean, really. And on and on and on. And you're going to be punished. And it's all about control. I said, they're trying to control us with all this you know, punishment and chapel every single day at school. Yep. They got so rid of it. This is they what happens when people send their kids to like Catholic school and stuff. And they, yeah, they, they can learn about being good. Instead, they mine the was Episcopalian, which is just Catholic light. <laughs> you know, it's nonsense. And That's my funny. best friend's father was a bishop, and I loved him. He was a great guy. He mm -hmm. spoke truth to power. Mm -hmm. Whenever they, you know, he was the Bishop of Washington, Bishop John T. Walker. What a light warrior this guy was. You know, he was into religion, but he was a light warrior. You know, when he was there with Martin Luther King in the cathedral before he died. Mm -hmm. He was there, you know, with, with the bushes and everybody sitting there at a, at a, cathedral service and he said he spoke truth to power and said power is being abused you know i wonder if they killed him but they said he died of natural causes but as you and i know that's not always the case sadly a heart, a heart attack is just a, a trigger pull away since the 70s i know and so you know there's a lot of good hearted people and um in religion in the business of religion and there's i don't know if you've ever seen there's these two jewish guys that do a channel, I sent you that video yesterday from them, mm -hmm. the open scroll. Yep. And these guys are hardcore Jewish guys, but boy, are they on the side of light and disclosure. Excellent. You know, and that shows you this is, a, you know, a very complex cross section of society mm -hmm. from the top down. Or yes. From the down up, really. This is completely pervasive in every angle of our society is this hidden hand at play right and and that's, and that's why i mean a lot of people like Corey good have said you know we need unity in the community and of course everyone hates him you know always into the blue chicken cult you know, it's like how do you know what the truth is you know how do you know we live in a universe that's infinitely vast and and there's all kinds of people out there why would you you know that's the that's the sort of infiltration of everything is you know you have dissenters and trolls on forums. I mean, there's there's people I that just. I don't really I don't really follow anybody that seems to, in any way, shape, or form, present that they know more than other people as like a definitive stance. And that guy seems to operate from that direction. So I don't really I don't really care for what he's putting out because it just seems disingenuous to be operating from that position to me. It seems very suspicious to me, and. I, Carrie Cassidy broached the topic first. She mm -hmm. said, I don't know what happened to Richard Dolan. He was on the forefront of disclosure in the 90s and early 2000s. And now all he'll talk about is like UFO stuff that happened in the 60s, which is safe. Those are safe topics. Mm -hmm. And very little about, nothing about the hard stuff, nothing about human trafficking or genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, and the same thing with Greer. Greer was on the cutting edge. And then a few years ago, he's like, well, the universe is benevolent, you know, mostly, I think. Yes, yes, but not all. And he's like, oh, no. You know, I know. I know the truth. Everyone else is wrong. And, that, and that's when I knew that, you know, are they manipulating us? I mean, are we being mind controlled now? I don't think so, because you and I are talking shit, man. We're talking smack. And Where I don't think so. But you never know. You, it's, it's, it's something we have to come to terms with. I'm going to make a suggestion. This is me speculating. I would say that I've been wholly processed. I would speculate that you have been also. And when you say, how come we're able to operate outside of that? I have an answer. And we are breaking the program. Um, yeah, the program I'm remembering been, the, things. 
the the idea was for people to get programmed and never have a, a recollection and to never make these connections. That program failed on you and it failed on me. So I do believe that there is, it could be as simple as a frequency being pumped out right now. A te sure. technology sure. that um, everyone else is receiving and acquiescing to, but folks like you and I, according to their system, are broken. Right. We don't there's, receive that uh, signal. There's something in my notes that I came across last night, and I'll send them to you. But I came across a story about how, you know, humans, we co-create our reality. Mm -hmm. That's the metagene. It's, it's, it's our power with our 12 strands of DNA. That's why we're so popular in the universe. Our genetics is because we have this ability to create reality. Uh, Alex Collier says the Andromedans are amazed at us. We leave a room and the room stays the way it was. They need technology to do that. If they need to manifest an orange, they do it with technology. We're like, fuck, man, I'm going to go grow it, you know, or, you know, whatever. And so I came across a story. I, I haven't heard it anywhere else, but, and I don't know the source. It's lost to time, but um, it said that when the Anunnaki and all the other uh, regressives came to this planet and wanted to, you know, conquer it and control it, they had a piece of technology, and this piece of technology is called the Atuwa, A-T-U-W-A-A. And this piece of gear, whatever it is, pyramid or some type of ancient, it's very, very ancient, it's illegal to own. Um, but this is where to activate it, you need the sacred word of the Freemasons, which a lot of people think is Om or something. But it's, that apparently has been, the pieces of the, this machine has been moved around. And so it doesn't work 100%. And that's why in the last 60, 70 years, the programming has been slowly broken down. Because in the 1960s, all the hippies, a lot of people say we almost broke away from the control system. Almost. Peace, love, John Lennon, you know. But, you know, they infiltrated it slowly, CIA, LSD, John Manson, you know the rest. And then in the 80s, it was the yuppies, a good economy. And man, all the toothpaste went back in the tube, except for that little bit of toothpaste at the end. And that's you, me, and everybody in the disclosure movement. Yep. When we were young, we didn't buy that shit. You know, how did I know at 11 that religion was bullshit? All my friends were sitting there praying, oh, don't rock the boat. And how, what do you mean, don't oh, believe in God? And I'm like, well, it sounds really fishy to me. All this stuff about loaves and fishes, I don't buy that shit, you know? And so though the, the little dissidents like us, you know, we were running around reading, you know, UFO books and conspiracy books and other things where other people were watching the football and soccer and, and everything else. You know, even though as a racing driver, I find sports incredibly boring to watch on TV. You know, it's one thing to be in a race car. That's living right. at 100%. Right. You know, death's doorstep every single moment you know you've lived at 100 percent in antarctica you know the, the drill and people like us tend to gravitate towards jobs like that you know i wanted to fly a fighter jet but i didn't have 20 20 vision you know but i flew a beaver float plane and I, you know i thought i was a hot shot you know this living on the edge this adrenaline addiction this this sort of it's because something i think in our minds is living 100 percent and the rest of our bodies have to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. So we do dangerous things. We're, you know, I want to drive a motorcycle at 180 miles an hour. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we do those things because then that's when our bodies were, we're at hundred percent. We're living hundred percent. But in those days I didn't have the spirituality I do now. And so you have to have that component to really be even attempt to be a whole person. You know, I'm nowhere near that, but I'm, Hey, I'm trying. I feel like it's in those environments where your your faculties actually all come on. That yep. if you're not in those modes, then you're you're not you. Right. Show me somebody who's asleep, and I'll show you somebody who's not living life at 100. percent Yeah. They they think idle speed is fine. Hey, I don't want to know any truth. I, I just want to sit in my easy chair. I want to varnish my my yacht. You know, the mast on my yacht. You know, I, I don't want to know John Order. Don't tell me those kinds. They, they say don't tell me those kinds of things. You'll upset my children, you know? And I'm thinking this is a person who has agreed in their soul agreement. I want to have a really bland life and I want to be asleep. Or 
I'm going to wake up at the very end in 20 years or whenever the shit hits the fan, I think. And they're going to, their heads are going to pop like popcorn, I, I, which is a valid experience in life. It's not our experience. You and I want to be on the front lines, but th that's perfectly valid experience in the cosmos is to, you want to be a, a, a nun and not do nothing with your life. You know, that's a valid experience. If you want to be a Green Beret, you know, or a Navy SEAL, that's a valid experience. Mm -hmm. Which, do you want to talk about this this whole dream thing, or you want to do that in another day? Um, the dream? Which which dream thing? Lucid dreams where we're doing strange things. Oh, we should probably just save that one for another time because it'll, it'll, it'll be another it'll be another two hour conversation and. Um, yeah. I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the conversation a hundred percent. But you would be surprised. Um, the longer the video, it becomes exponentially harder to process. Got it. No, so I know. If, if we TV. keep going forever, then it'll just like I'll, it'll take me nine days to process this thing. No, we'll do it again. But yeah, I, absolutely. I, before I go, I just want to give a shout out to. I support everyone in the disclosure movement. I mean, every single person, because every perspective is valuable. But I especially appreciate the people who are into the harder stuff. You know, I don't claim to be a, a veteran of the programs or anything special like that. Um, but the people who have been through that horrible experience, like you have, you know, I really salute. My hat is off to you guys. Because that took me years to, to come to terms with. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't want to believe this. But after a while, you can't, you can only fool yourself so much exactly and yeah so my hat is off you know the, the it's my experience with the wounded vets at my farm and i talk to them and you know some of those guys have shrapnel these young guys have hundreds of pieces of shrapnel still in them and i say what's your wife and, and daughter's names and sometimes they'll have to wait a half an hour and they'll say i'll get back to you and they're like oh yeah half an hour later they're like yeah sally and, and that breaks your heart yep you know and what i know there's medical technologies to cure all that mm-hmm Med beds, sound, light, and color, vibration, frequency. William Wright for the smart All dude. of that. And they won't let that out for kids with cancer. That's, yep. that's abominable. That's a whole other reason to be someone to come out, you know, not just write books or, you know, do something, but come out and say, you know, this is it. This is my experience. It's my opinions on my family alone. I don't speak for my father or Chris Mellon or the Mellon family. I speak for me only. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, because I'm not a mouthpiece for anyone. Trust me on that. Totally understood, John. I'm doing I'm doing the same thing from my direction. You you are John Warner. Exactly. I'm Eric Hecker. I can speak for me. You can speak for you. Um, but there's no reason that we should keep our um, we shouldn't have any muzzles on. We should be able to no. say what we want in any direction we want, and people can engage. No, that time is past. Well past. Yeah. And um, you know, even though I have issues with other people, you know, on certain things, it doesn't matter. We're, we're all on the same side, basically. I, I think and, we're all moving uh, in the same direction to help everyone. And if right. that's your agenda, then you're just going to come work with us. If you're not going to come work with us, then you're on the other side. It's okay. Now we that's know who thing. you are. You know, if people don't want to come to terms with it, I think all we need is the 5% that mm -hmm. Penny said. Yep. I really think that's 360 million people. I think that's doable in 25 years. I think we because do much faster the, than that. The last 10 years is exponentially more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris Mellon and Elizondo. At least they brought brought it out officially for the Pentagon. The Navy, you know, Nimitz UFO stuff. Yep. It's a good first step. They didn't say shit. They said, gosh, what a mystery. You know, gee whiz. You know, Navy pilots don't say gosh. They say fucking A, man. Look at that thing. Weapons free. You know, they don't say that shit. You know, they, 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 that was a ginger snap and lemonade, you know, initiative. A production. Limited hangout. But at least they brought it out into the media. And the media is all over. Chris, you know, every time he wants something, he's in the Washington Post. He's been challenging the Pentagon to release more. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you can't be in the disclosure movement or an activist if you work in for the, the guys, work for the deep state. See if you can get him to come on. We'll do a round table. We'll give him, we'll, we'll oh. catch him in the middle. Sure. Yeah, in a million years, no way. When he, if he ever sees this, he's gonna be pissed as hell. Like, God damn that crazy John! We're gonna kill him. Yeah, you know, but I don't care. You know, but I also know he's a good guy. I know, I know people's hearts. He's not an evil guy. 
But I think maybe he really does believe that the report that's that thin they gave him was all there is. That's a possibility. I think think he knows what we're talking about, but but maybe only to a limited degree. Mm -hmm. You have to remember compartmentalization is an ironclad. It's such a good tool. It's such a good tool. tool. It's so it's so effective. I only worked on the gizmo. I don't know what those guys down the hall were doing. You know, you know, and they're literally. I've been in big, large, large computer labs, let's just say. And I swear to God, the people on the other side of the room had no idea what the other people were doing on the other side of the freaking room. It drove me nuts. Nope. Yeah, there's a a lot of people. um, It's empowering in their mind to be a specialist in their compartment. So they don't ever want to talk outside of their compartment to anyone about anything because then they're no longer the expert and their ego can't handle not being right about everything. Yeah, it's like my O&I Navy captain friend. I'm like, he's bragging about the Navy satellites that can track, you know, those bastard UFOs Mm -hmm. punching in and out superluminal, which is beyond the speed of light. And he says that the Navy satellites can track UFOs 50 miles below the ocean or the earth. And I said, well, have you heard of this project and Project Looking Glass and, you know, Project Seagate and all this stuff? And he's like, no. Mm -hmm. And he said, I I cannot believe someone in a service uniform would do anything that was illegal and against the Constitution. And I said, I agree with you that most service people do not. They're good people. It's the 10% rule. Right. That's like like thinking that... Like someone yeah, gets the badge, that means they can't commit a crime? Well, what's the internal affairs division for in every precinct? They're blackmailed or they're, you know, the national I, security contract says we can, we have the right to kill you if you tattletale. I grew up with kids that were derelicts that literally became cops because they were like, here's the deal. If we're cops, <laughs> we can get away with anything. Like literally, that's what their yeah, goal, they did that. Did I grew up with dudes that were crooks that straight up went to the police academy to become better crooks. Right. But, you know, that's not all police. It's not all of them, but they exist. You know, if you're a black ops Delta force, you know, that goes and fights off world, you know, I wouldn't want to tangle with you, but, you know, you know, most service people are doing their jobs and they're, they're fantastic people, but it's, it's people who get caught up in the black programs or blackmailed into them. Mm Mm-hmm. And, you know, I may have Mellon family members who went into banking or something else and they got into a room and they got blackmailed with, you know, the naked kids in the bed. And they're like, you work for us now. Come up with some derivatives to fuck over everyone. And they don't have a choice because you can't get out from under. Yeah, that that's the other thing to your viewers. If Eric and I are caught with pictures of us, you know, like that compromising, you know who did it because we're talking about it. And that's the dirty secret. That's how the world, or they show you the wood chipper as one Marine Corps guy. They they could digitize anything nowadays too. Yeah. Senators or congressmen who dare interest themselves in any of this black programs, USAP stuff, Mm -hmm. they will be politely told off. And if they don't listen, they're shown the wood chipper. They're kidnapped in the middle of the night. They go out to some farm and, you know, they have line them up, 10 of them, they don't, you know, and they put a guy through the wood chipper and they smash their faces in the goo. And they say, you will tow the line and you will not interest yourselves in our business. And it's interesting how matter of fact that can be. And that came from, a, I'm not going to say his name, but a Marine Corps guy who was a, later a general. And uh, he said, you know, that's how the world works. Mm-hmm. But don't ever say my name and don't you know the deal i mean and, and i never would i would never give anyone's name away unless it has to do with my family there's what happens in the daylight and there's happens at night and that, that i'm truly sad about all that mm-hmm. you know i mean it just it makes me so sad mm-hmm. uh it's I just, just remember really- i just remember the thing i forgot before that i phased out on you were talking about good days and bad days and having to appreciate oh them. yeah that's what I would say to my customers when I had to bring them down. That's what I forgot earlier. Yeah. I would have to get yeah, them on their hard day, and I would, I would teach them that, yes, you're having a bad day, the worst day, like you said, but this day is necessary because it teaches you to appreciate the good days. Right. 
this is a, a sort of a spiritual lesson uh, that the philosophers will tell you, the dark night of the soul. You know, I, ha I have titanium bits holding my spine together. I'm in chronic pain every day. Mm -hmm. And I have depression, runs in the family. And so, you know, my wife always says, count your blessings and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm in pain. But, you know, it's depression and chronic pain, those kinds of things, low, lose a leg, you're a wounded veteran. It's a, you know, something like that, that kind of vein. It's also a gift. Because by and large, people that, that are waking up, a lot of them, artists, musicians, writers, you know, this creative thing, depression is key in that. So there's something there going on. Um, I think you're going to have a better chance of somebody suffering from something. They'll be more attuned to higher concepts than, than just regular folks. I can follow that's that 100%. My theory. You know, that's my crackpot theory, but I, I've read that in philosophy and I'm like, yeah, I think it gives you bigger perspective that I'm um, having. Yeah, a, yeah having you could be the health. richest billionaire in the world, but if you don't have your health, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're in pain, and hey, I don't give a damn. You know when, mm -hmm. and when I had a divorce, I my heart was broken. I mean, that, none of that wealth is going to protect you from a lot of the most painful stuff. Yeah, you don't have to suffer with poverty and be a debt slave, but I've heard everyone under five hundred million is a debt slave. It's only when you get to the billion in mark, they're like, yeah, you're one of the, you're one of the club, but you're still all those people, at the top of the black pyramid, you know, all those people are just trusty slaves mm -hmm. themselves. Queen of England, Pope. Yep. They're all, they're they're all management. They're all management. And we're well, not aware of who they, 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 they work for because they're not the owners. No. But with so, that being I mean, said, <laughs> we we keep we can keep we can keep going with this yeah the, we can just keep going but I, I will i will leave off that next time we will pick up we need to pick up with the lucid dreams which is a great conversation and the ufo tracking i think is actually a great conversation with the satellite systems and stuff and i think that would really blow people's minds scalar oh and scalar too i'm gonna write that one down actually too because I, I love that the, i do love Thanks, scalar germany. actually that's, that's a from great world war ii germany yep i wonder who gave them that technology <laughs> Schauberger. <clears throat> no, I wonder where he got it from. <laughs> oh. Oh, you know, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. But Herman Oberth, as you know, <clears throat> a general, said we had help from people from other worlds. Mm -hmm. He said it. You know, but you know, Joseph P. Farrell does a really good job in his books, but he's an Oxford theologian. And he's a little scared of the ET angle, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's so is, you know, some others. That's I'm not knocking him. I, I appreciate oh, all but this is again like Come on, people. This is not rocket science. No pun intended, but it was a good one. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> not rocket science. People have been visiting Earth. We are ETs ourselves. It's not that big a deal. Everyone's like, oh, that's the wild stuff. Why can't we all just get along? <laughs> yeah. Well, the Anunnaki caste system. That's why. Yeah, exactly. Division. Blatant yeah. intended division. Where are you in the disclosure movement caste system? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm at the end of the rail line with you and Penny and everybody else and Carrie Cassidy and Simon Parks and Niles Collier. Yep. We're at the end of the rail line. End of the line. Yep. The bad and stuff. Grouping. Horrible, dirty more, stuff. More people keep finding themselves over in this direction, and it's a beautiful it thing. Kind of, yeah, you can go off on a million tangents mm -hmm. and go, I'm just going to study UFOs or, or Venus. Mm -hmm. But eventually, years later, it will always bring you back down to, you know, the dark stuff. Yeah. Because it's all so intertwined. That's what it, cult. It's, it's, it completely yeah. matters because that's why we're not aware. There's a reason we're not aware, and the reason is not good. Right. See, that you know, this World War II secrets book mm -hmm. says nothing about the Vril and Tula societies or the occult because this is the official narrative. Yeah, I just saw the top corner says National Geographic on it, so it's the it's the super yep. edited history version. Yeah. I tried to bring this up with a, the Harvard professor, and he's like, "There's nothing to that. That's all nonsense." Mm. I, I said, "You're either a fucking liar or you know the dumbest professor in the world." I've met so many brilliant morons in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm the smartest guy in the world. I'm not, but I've met so many Harvard or Oxford or you know these people, and they either email me, and they're like, "Don't ever email me again. You're a crackpot. You're an idiot." And I'm not, you know, I know my World War II history and they don't, and they're just ignore it. They're like, if it's not in the official narrative, I you know, same with history in general, mm -hmm. it's not in the official narrative. 
forget it. I'll lose my tenure. I'll lose. I'll be ostracized. One guy told me, he said, look, I can't talk about that stuff. I know what you're talking about, the occult, World War II, Tula Society. Mm -hmm. But he's like, I'm not going to talk to you about it. Because if my colleagues find out, I'll lose my job. And yeah. I was a you know, history professor. That's that's legit. That's what we're up against. And um, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to shamelessly promote myself at this point. It is very hard to find employment when you speak the way that I do. Um, yep. I'm happy. That, man, I'm man. happy that you're all right in this equation. But folks, uh, hit that PayPal button. Hit the Patreon thing. Do what you can because folks like me, they're trying to squish us out. I mean, right. this is this is not an easy position for me to be in. Um, That's why I want to get other committee of three hundred families and other wealthy people to be involved because they've got money. Fair enough. And I'm, I'm realize, not arguing that. If there's like, any white and, hat rich person that wants to support the direction that I'm going, by all means, do it. <laughs> yeah, like Lawrence, Lawrence Rockefeller supported Greer in the early days. Mm -hmm. But that went south. You know, he died and it all went south. But, you know, if you can get millions and tens of millions of dollars into the disclosure movement, yeah. then you're going to see a supercharged effect. I've never I'm run really away from hard work in my Ooh. life. I've never run away from hard work in my life. I would be no, working very not. hard right now if the contract was available, but it seems I don't get contracts offered to me anymore. So I'm, yeah. I'm not I, I write the opportunity to work hard. Every that? day. I write and research 12 hours a day. Right. My I, wife I have to shift gears. Hide my laptop from me. I'm, I'm, I'm starting a website and becoming a, a, a citizen journalist at this point because the tools that I used to make money with are no longer being hired. So I bought a new toolkit. And I'm starting myself in a new trade and I'm learning. I'm going to, I'm going mean, to broadcast serious, the truth. That takes I'm, serious balls. It really does. I'm sorry for the women viewers. That's okay. was, we cuss like sailors in Shanghai here, but yeah. you know, that really does take cojones. It, it, it's, it's really hard. I mean, I'm, I'm a wealthy person. I, I can do whatever I want basically within reason. Um, you know, I'm not super wealthy. I have enough to be comfortable, but not enough to get in trouble with, you know, I can't buy a newspaper and say, ah, UFOs. Yeah. You're not raising Once small armies market. yet? You're not that level of wealth? No way. Um, I'm sure Chris Mellon can buy and sell me right and left. But <laughs> but it's it's enough to, you know, I encourage other wealthy people. You've got to try to understand your reality. You've got to understand what's really going on and don't trust the, the media. The entire media is corrupt. It always has been. In the 90s, I said, they're lying on CNN, Dad. And he's like, well, that's their job, bastards. You know, mm -hmm. disclosure, you know, the media's corrupt, Viacom, you know, come on now. Mm -hmm. Seven corporations basically own the world, I guess, yep. in, in that sense, in the corporate sense. Yeah, and, and know, the dissemination of information. So yeah. Deutsche Bank has its own black ops team, the Air Force. They just call it up. So, you know, like CIA. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they could call the CIA. Oh, we need some fighter planes. Yeah, exactly. Printing presses. We're printing money in Iraq. Apparently totally. that's a thing to counterfeit or print new money in Iraq and ship it back to Germany and stuff. I don't know, but that's a rumor I heard. Anything's but possible. Because big banks print their own money. That's inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, and the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And, you know, those of us in the middle, it's disgusting. Yeah. Those of us with little conscience. And I'm not, you know, I'm trying to understand duality in the universe, but it's pretty hard. You know, I, I saw something once it said it's the job of the people at the top to get the people in the middle to think it's the people at the bottom that are causing all the trouble. Anunnaki caste system. Yeah, know. that's what's going on. That's what it is. Go go right back. It's in the it's in the Anunnaki texts. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy to find. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone, you know, it's it's a difficult world to piece together, but with my notes and some of my writings, I'm trying to boil it down to some essences that people can grasp easier. At least. I like that. Never going to be easy. This Correct. is very complicated stuff. It's big and picture it sounds stuff. Like problem unless you do the work. But we're all going to have to get there, most of us, or we're in shit trouble. That is a fact. I'm, we're already, I'm happy. We're already in shit trouble. I mean, big time. Yeah, we're, we're already there. We've always, Earth has always been at war for the last 12,000 years. Yep. And before that, Atlantis and was in a cosmic war. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... Earth is a battleground as well as a school of hard knocks. Big time. It's a bloody battleground. And that gets back to the, you know, mass death ritual kind of thing. Yeah. It's horrifying. Yeah. If we look at it on big scales and big timetables, 
and 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 honestly look at what's the what is the activity going on here if you're to be looking outward from outward looking in you know what would what would someone's assessment like if someone was to write a story like hey i visited this planet over here and here's my book report on it what would their summary be well i I think they'd be number one if they were a decent uh, positive vibrational people they would say i feel very sorry for those people you know forget the inner earth people Mm -hmm. you know they're just i don't know i don't know what they're doing hanging out you wonder now like like if somebody if somebody could just be parked up there and they were just watching what's really Uh, going on for half a million years what would be the summary of what happened i don't know I, I think a lot of them are higher vibration. They just want to live here in peace. Others want to help us in very subtle ways. You know, the law of non-intervention, is cosmic law. You know, in Star Trek, it's the prime directive. And so they abide by that. Mm-hmm. But I've also heard that they've been getting a slap on the wrist for being too conservative with that. Mm-hmm. So an ET race that comes here, you know, and they do, and they, they do tulips. And then they're like, all right, we're going to split. We've been here a thousand years. Really cool. But we're going to split. Too many wars, a lot of negativity. And um, they don't want to interfere, but they probably come away with a profound sadness. And they may have tried to help us in subtle ways, you know, some of the good people in history, you know, Joan of Arc or something, you know, and incarnated here. And you and I may be ET, partially ET souls that have incarnated here to do a job. That's a possibility too. Um, Light warriors, light workers, you know, volunteers. They say Earth is the darkest place in the universe, the Andromedans Mm -hmm. said. That's not something to be proud of, my fellow Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, I think think visiting races would um, shake their heads and go, I don't know how they're going to get out of this because we have the most severe amount of control. And the fact that we co-create our reality with our captors, our, our slavers, that I think a lot of ET races come here and they're like, bye-bye, you know, I wish, wish we could help, you know, I don't know what's going to help you guys. And uh, I've heard other star systems may have been liberated, but this is, you know, it's Guadalcanal, man. It's, it's uh, you know, in World War II, it was, uh, you know, Hand-to-hand combat in the mud. That's that's our situation on Earth. And I mean, we're all in it. It's just a lot of people don't realize it. And those that do, you know, wow, does it make you feel small? What am I going to do to help? What can I do? And the only thing I could do is write, mm-hmm. you know. And we'll get into that on our next thing. But, you know, all of a sudden at age 48, I could write. I, what? Yeah. You know, my friends said, you know, teach yourself to write. Write something, you know. Lo and I, behold, I wasn't really good at anything else, but I, you know, I could write. I enjoy reading your emails. I find you're a very good writer. <laughs> well, read, read, I'll read some chapters. Uh, I'll send you my book. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. But it does talk about some disclosure mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's, that's all I can do is, is try to entertain people, but also say, Hey, what if, mm-hmm. you know, you gotta lead people who are, asleep very gently through that garden. Um, I tried to pull them along in, you know, typical Warner fashion. Come on, you! Like my dad. It's like, you can't do that. They'll just collapse. And I've seen them do it. They're just like, I don't want to know anymore. Mm-hmm. And so you have to gently and say, what, what do you think about this concept? And be very gentle. And that's what you do. You know, you're really good at that. Don't ever sell yourself short. The Thank reason you. I'm here with you is because our zany sense of humor, but uh, we have a lot of commonalities uh, despite our differing backgrounds. But you have a gift of being that gentle presenter. You know, a lot of people bring on guests and they harangue them. And it's like, that's not the way to make friends. (laughs) Yeah, no. I think I learned my skill set as a plumber going to people's homes. And but it was listening. part of what who you are. Like, I'm a nice person too. And it's like, oh, nice guys finish last. And it's like, I wonder who came up with that saying. The bad guys did. The Nazis did. You know, yeah. don't be nice. The last guys finish last. No, they don't. That's a lie. I just always looked at it as the, the, lie. the supposed good guy thinks the race is over and that they won. Yeah. I'm in it for the, I'm marathon. I'm long haul. The race ain't over. Yeah, this oil pipeline won't burst if I pull, twirl this valve. That's an old wives' tale. <laughs> you know, 
it's amazing the, the, the propaganda and lies. I mean, I really, it's, it's incredible to examine mm-hmm. the amount of control needed to keep people asleep on this planet. That's the part phenomenal. That's the part that actually frustrates me because, yeah, it's like if you really, if you're really interested, I mean, you simply just have to pick your head up out of your ass and look around, and you'll. I was like, you know, when I stopped watching the news, I mean, my wife and I watch snippets of the news to see what they're up to. Mm-hmm. You know, oh no, mm-hmm. you know, they're up to something. They're trying to impeach Trump right now, you know, that's not going to fly. It's all distraction. State of the but, propaganda is what I call the news. It just. But the other technology needed, you know, is incredible. The amount of power, you know, that's why we have to co-create our reality. Mm-hmm. They couldn't do it without us. Yeah, They're not smart enough. They're not, you know, they don't have 12 strands of DNA. We do. Now, mm-hmm. right now, we're the little puppets on the strings, but they've also got Siberian wolves. You know, we used to be puppies, mm-hmm. but now we're Siberian wolves, and they've got us by the years. Mm-hmm. Now, how much longer can they keep them? Keep yep. all, all the, and there's more and more wolves every day in the disclosure movement. I stole someone's you prey. You're burying my fangs. I'm like ripping and snorting. You know, I can't wait to bite that hand. I stole someone's phrase, and I can't remember where I heard this. So I, I, this is not, I didn't originate this, but someone else said, and I agree. I'm not trying to wake up sheep. I don't care. The sheep can sleep. They're not going to help me and my mission. I'm trying to wake up the lions. Yep. There and are lions out there. Yeah, that's like these kids, you know, my, my step-grandson is incredibly smart. He's building giant Star Wars things. I mean, he understands portals, but that's all Minecraft bullshit. Mm-hmm. But still, he's super smart. Uh, I've, I've met high school kids that are waking up. Mm-hmm. The young people get it. You know, they've been through all the sci-fi, the later sci-fi stuff where they, although Close Encounters was a docudrama, thank you, President Reagan and Steven Spielberg. Right. But, you know, that was that was my era, which that was a, that had a lot of disclosure in it, by the way, mm-hmm. for the era. Yep. And everyone thought, ah, that's John Warner and those crazy UFO nut jobs, you know. But now they're throwing things at us so fast, like the the TV series Dark, you know, time travel, you yep. know, physics, you know, and that you know, it's, it's very hard to follow. Um, but they are telling us, you know, and the young people are like. You know, they're talking portals and stargates and wormholes and, and yep. time travel. You know, they don't believe in it yet, but some of them are waking up. You're their absolutely brains, right. Their Everyone, brains aren't diametrically opposed to it as a possibility. Yeah. People over 35, by and large, not all, but by and large, are a lost cause. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sad. And it, it, it's, you know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. But the young people, forget it, man. They're, they're on it. They just need that extra... You know, you have to lead them gently mm-hmm. and say, you know, I always tell these people when I give them my information you know, in note form, I say, look, I never know anything for sure. You need to trust your own mind, your heart, your, your sixth sense, and, it, and give it time. And if it resonates with you, move forward. If it doesn't resonate with you, leave it alone. Yep, you know, exactly. You've got to be passive, but gently persuasive. And so that's important because a lot of people are banging drums. You know, I like David Icke. He calls it like it is, mm-hmm. but he kind of spits it in your face a little bit. That's not a criticism, just an observation. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like, you wankers, you motherfuckers. You know, I dig that. Mm-hmm. But personally, I, I would take it more, you know, gentle. I enjoy him too. I couldn't, I couldn't do that either, even though I like – in a way, I could almost say, like, I share all of his emotion, but I yeah, just, I don't share I do the too. ability to deliver that way. Right, I do too. He came out in the mid-90s when, boy, he was this celebrity soccer player and presenter, and everyone thought, this guy's gone mad. That took courage. That's a that's a John Kennedy book, Profiles and Courage. I'd like to write another one about people in the disclosure movement. And I would include all, all the famous people like Cass, Carrie Cassidy and Stephen Greer. They've all done good work in their, in their genre of this disclosure. That's profiles and courage. Mm-hmm. You know, because, you know, in the early days, like Phil Schneider got, you know, he got uh, wasted. They yep. killed him. Others that we don't know their names. Countless others, probably. Tons. Frank Olson got chucked and, in the window. You know, that's, a, you know, David Icke, you know, that, that's a profile and courage. Alice Collier, when he did his first presentations in the 1990s, most of his crowd 
hated him. They threw insults. If you watch the older videos of his, how do you know? You know, you're an asshole. You're an idiot. You know, it's he's like, why are you here? The door's open. Mm -hmm. There's no racing harnesses on those seats. Right. Go. So, so you know, if I ever speak to a group of they want me, of young people, if they want me to, I would preface everything as I do, and just say, listen, if you don't like what I have to say, you know, there's the door. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I, I'm, I'm not, in the back burner of my brain of hope. I, I dream of someday having some folks up here to talk and and oh, you will on topic, oh, and um, maybe you can come up to Alaska sometime and chat on these things. Don't think my wife and I haven't thought about it because I've always wanted to go. I've never, never been. been up here before. No, I'd love to go. You should come up in the summertime. Alaska is freakishly beautiful. I, I've heard. And yeah. uh, I've been over Canada in a float plane mm -hmm. you know, when I was flying with my brother-in-law. So that western part of Canada. But we, I always wanted to go to Alaska. As a, so as I, a testament, and, as a testament really, to Alaska's and, beauty, I'll tell you, yeah. my girlfriend has traveled to over 50 countries extensively. Okay. And she says she lives in Alaska because it's the most beautiful place in the world. Wow. I mean, it, your video of the woods was unbelievably beautiful. Oh, my God. I went you're to under another 10, one. Your studio is under 10 feet of ice, right? <laughs> you got a snow cat idling outside with a radar dish on it, right? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. You, I have a picture of your house from satellite. That's so funny. Yeah. It's cool. You, you got it going on there. It's, it's fun here. And it's, it's really pretty in the wintertime. Um, it's more beautiful in the summertime. It's just unbelievable. It's just better and better. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, John, I really appreciate all the time that you gave me today. I look forward to speaking to you again because it seems that we never run out of things to talk about every time we chat. We didn't talk about cars. <laughs> we didn't even talk about cars this time. Street yeah, racing, street racing right? and yep. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of more Long Island conversations that we can have. And um, I look forward to having my website up and running soon so that we can uh, engage more of these conversations in a really free environment where we can really say whatever we want. Because right now we have the YouTube restrictions to deal with. Um, but this was a great intro conversation um, for us to get your voice out there and get your experiences into the mix. And hopefully, like you said, we can inspire other people to do exactly what you're doing is sharing your part as you're learning. Yeah, it's a very, it's, it, it's all you really can do uh, besides, you know, I can write a little bit, but it's important, I think, uh, for people and not just see, uh, you know, you want to have a variety of people. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I discussed it, should I go on, you know, or should I keep anonymous? And it's like, no, if you really feel that um, it's good to, to tell your story, I mean, I don't think my story is all that big of a deal, but you know, it's at least it, it fills in some gaps for people. Um, I don't know. She's she's up to something. <laughs> you know, she's gonna take it out right now. <laughs> this would probably be a, a good platform for me to do it. I, I'm not gonna go with onto Greer or somebody else. One of those, you know, UFO bigwigs. You know, I'm not knocking them. It's just not my thing. I like the grassroots level. That's important. Mm -hmm. Because that's where, you know, like I said, we're at the end of the rail line. And, um, you know, there's only a few people willing to go to the end of the rail line. I don't blame I'm glad them. I noticed that because I, I, I like your analogy on this because I really feel like I've been pushed to the end of the line. I don't have anywhere else to go. This is it. I have to figure this out. I have to get this truth out at all costs because it's, I either accomplish this and it's to my success. Or it's going to be my ruin. No, no. I don't think so at all. I, I hope you're dark, right. <laughs> this dark tunnel at the end of the line is seriously dark. And I, 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 I don't blame people for being scared or skeptical. It's truly wild, the wild stuff. It's the wilder than the wild stuff. And it's very difficult to examine and talk about. It is extremely difficult. Very I mean, I've seen a river of tears. I'm done. You know, I, I, I just, I can't anymore. I get that. You know, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to be part of the solution no matter what I do. That's the way I look at it is that it's, you and I are, that's our, you know. Yeah, there's, there's only one direction there. to go and it's to make a better world for our children is the way I look that's at not, it. For my, for my step-grandson and my nephews and, and all the children I know, yep. you know. There's so, a better potential that we can reach. 
and we can do it by working together and everybody sharing their stories collectively. That's how we're going to grow. Yeah, we'll get some hate emails, but you know, those oh, are people all day long. I get them. <laughs> that's, that's part of it. That's okay. I mean, it, you know, um, but I think the people that are truly searchers, mm -hmm. and, you know, the ones with a soul that just cannot be satisfied. Yes. Um, will find you. Yeah. You know, yep. and they might find some of my work, um, but they'll find you. And, and that's a good thing. That's, you know, cool. trust well, me, they're, they're, it's like I said, the 10% rule, the 90th percent of us are good people mm -hmm. with a positive vibration. You know, Bob Marley said it. That's the I'm way I'm going to run my intentions. Bond. Yeah. I'm going to get love good intentions for the rest of the day. And I'm going to even, I'm going to try to get another video from outside. I tried the other day and I screwed up all my camera settings and I came back with no audio. Yeah. yeah. So it's a no audio issue week, I guess. That black triangle hovering above you. Uh-huh. Yep. All you right. Make Don. a Faraday cage of your house. I'm working on that. <laughs> yeah. I got all these trash cans in stores, you know, and, the guy that works for me, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, the Faraday cages. I got to hide all my electronics in them. Yep, I don't yep. think it will really work now. They've got, if they do lob off a serious weapon, it's going to fry everything. But There's so much stuff out there tech-wise. It's, yeah, yeah, I mean, where do we, where do we even begin to discuss? You can drive yourself crazy trying to protect yourself from, you know, I've got, you know, I have some emergency food and medical supplies, mm -hmm. but I didn't go overboard. You know, it, it, it's like, how are you going to secure a bunker full of food and ammo and weapons from everyone who wants them? I mean, they never talk about that. You can't. As far as I'm concerned, if you can't walk with it, you don't need it when it comes to no, that it, point. It's you, to share. Yeah, yeah. You have tools you know, to get things that you need done, but the things that you need at that point are anchors. Yeah. You know, what are you going to do? Have 10,000 cans of food? Well, now you can't go away from your 10,000 cans of food. Yeah, it's dumb. But yeah. if you share with others, mm -hmm. And you build bridges and goodwill mm -hmm. with people in an, in an emergency situation. We yep. lose power or services. Yep. You know, that's what you want. Um, you know, what a lot of people think is going to happen in the future is a lot of people are just going to, you know, there's a town in, in England and they abide by pagan laws and peaceful and they don't pay taxes or whatever. I, I don't think they do. But groups of people just saying we're not going to be part of it anymore mm -hmm. and we're going to deal with the law of one and we're going to be fair we're going to love everybody you know not to the extent of the hip the hippies had the right ideas but they were surrounded by the matrix and so the communes were infiltrated and all that peace and love shit mm -hmm. went down the drain with you know charlie manson mm -hmm. and so you know but the 60s they, they had the right idea but they didn't have the tools to do it. Nowadays, we have people with the tools and technology mm -hmm. to do that. I and agree. just, hey, we're going to start, you know, another Levitt town in Alaska, and everyone will be like-minded, and, and we'll share with people. You want to join us, you know, be service to others. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Right? And that's how, you know, and just... I've already been talking America to folks about the possibility of... Laws, you know? I've already been talking to folks about the possibility of some sort of like a, a retreat slash truth training facility type thing up here. Yeah. And they'll be infiltrated, but you just you know, go up to the people and say, you know, listen, Mr. CIA, mm -hmm. if you want to join us, great. We love you and we, you know, forgive you. And, but you know, go oh, yeah. yep. I, I've already done the thing with volunteer organizations with an open door. So to say, and I'm well aware that an open door is an open door. And you have to pay attention to who you're letting in because it will happen. Yeah, it's it's not gonna. It won't be an easy thing. It'll be no, nothing. But nothing worth getting done is ever easy. Right. There's already pockets of people that are in the know. Mm -hmm. You know, the disclosure movement. We're all over the world, mm -hmm. but we do. You know, there are small communities. But you can't. The problem with the UFO uh, stuff like Contact in the Desert and Mufon, they've all been infiltrated. Mm -hmm. But they're like, so what? Right. We don't care. They can know whatever we know. You know, they can have write our names down, take our photos. You know, yep. they can track you all over the earth with your bio signature, electromagnetic. So there's no privacy. It's like, hey, man. That's the way I look at it. I might as well speak my mind then. Yeah. <clears throat> it just, you know, you're better keeping off. The, doing keeping my thoughts in my head is only allowing me and they, the powers that be, to know what's going on. So now yeah. I'll just let everyone know. If it's I have a heart attack, if I have a heart attack tomorrow, or they saw through my, you know, Cadillac brakes, 
Yep. You yep. know that I exactly. Right. That's, that's right. basically right. where I'm at at this stage of the game. Is if they wipe me out right now, they're just proving that there was a reason to keep me quiet. I I'm a little bit more positive on this side of the coin. I think that we do have a lot of positive influences, whether it be ET or military industrial complex, or there's a lot more good people going, you know, I'm tired of being blackmailed. I'm tired of this, you know, and they're on our side, but you're never going to hear about them. In other words, Greer told me he had protection from people in the Pentagon or whatever. Now he doesn't know who they are, Mm -hmm. but he says, I have protection. And I believe that because back in when the days when he was doing stuff, that was extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. And how did he survive? How did Richard Dolan survive? How did Kerry Cassidy survive? There has to be people behind the scenes protecting people in disclosure movement who flap their gums. That's what I'm hoping for. There's a little voice in my head. When I think about saying stuff, I, I just, I keep thinking that it's, it's just say it because if I would have been stopped already is the way that I think about it. So I, in a way, I imagine that there are folks that are letting me say it and want, and want me to. Yeah. They, they, by all the things I've heard in the DC world, my little cadre of, of people that I know here, they want people to talk about this. Mm-hmm. They want people to, because they can't on the inside of right. the projects or the military industrial complex or even the military. They've sworn oaths of secrecy and they take them very seriously. Mm-hmm. And I appreciate that. And I pe- appreciate people who work in those services, not the black projects. I think that's naughty, naughty. Mm-hmm. Um, no, what they're doing is disgusting, but you know, they could have cured cancers 75, 80 years ago, yeah. Dr. Royal Rife. He came out with sound vibration to get rid of viruses and cancer. Um, and Otto, him to sleep. Otto Warburg, if I get, I'm getting my a couple memory. of those guys knew that vibration, sound, light, and color would okay. kill pathogens. The guy that got the Nobel prize for discovering cancer simultaneously presented the cure, but we don't talk about that part. Literally, this is referenceable. The guy that got the Nobel Prize for discovering cancer, was I think it was Warburg. I think it was Otto Warburg, but I could be getting that name wrong. He found cancer and the cure, presented it to the world. They gave him a Nobel Prize and then stopped discussing that he came up with the cure. Right. They gave him the, the deal you can't refuse. Mm-hmm. You know, either we kill you and your family, you know, or we give you a lot of money. Which one are you going to take? Just as and everyone would take the money, pretty much. Most you and I might be crazy. Compromise. You. <laughs> yeah. No, but nobody else would. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. So. Well, John. We, good stuff. We, we have got to stop this at some point. I'm never going to be able to produce it. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk cars next time, too. Yeah, right. I, I think we're, we're getting one energy generator in my reality. Camaro. Oh, yeah. I could talk about cars for eons. Anti-gravity Camaro, man. I did it in my garage. And then they get a knock on the door. Uh, you know, Boeing owns that patent. Really? For a Camaro? <laughs> Shut up, kid. <laughs> I swear, because I was going to make that back by at some point. God hates you. <laughs> God, the devil. Hates, God the hates metalheads. You work for the devil. I'm like, well, he's not paying me enough. Jeez. Well, everybody, please check out Little Anton by john w warner um i'll have to take a look at that one john if you send it my way i'll definitely take a look at it because i it's very I long, it's you very long book uh-huh. in, in three parts but mm-hmm. my second book will be a lot shorter and faster and no more point. dynamic and more disclosure so no do it up disclosure baby you'll love the ss stuff all that oh yeah strange stuff my character beatrice goes through oh boy interesting well folks thank- anti-gravity technology Cool. Very cool. Well, take, take a look, folks, and, and um, take a look at what John W. Warner IV is doing on the scene because I will definitely be having him back on this show. And I imagine after what he was talking about today, you'll probably see other people trying to talk to him too. So I'm sure there'll be more of John going on. And I think I'll stick with you. You got it. <laughs> stick around. I'm, I'm, I'm but fine having that going on. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to be interviewed by anybody else. No um, worries. Just stay with me, John. Just try to be a nice guy. Yeah. A small thing. I don't take any profits from my work. It all goes to wounded veteran charities. Nice. That's awesome, John. Good for you. He needs the money. Shoot him in the butt. Go buy his books so that he can help veterans. I like the sounds of that. 
Yeah. And that's another thing, you know, I have a big problem with people like Chris Mellon who, you know, tell lies to the American people and get paid for it. Mm. So sorry, cousin. I, you know. Jeez. Well, I'm a truth speaker. I'm not getting paid to speak the truth, but if you guys want to hit that button on the bottom for Patreon or PayPal in the comments, I would appreciate it. Oh, and if you're into CBD products, folks, I am a big fan of CBD products, and there is a link down there as well. I am affiliated with a CBD company that I use and recommend. And if you use CBD products, use the ones I use. If you know one that's better, tell me. Pot, everyone. There you go. Do that too. <laughs> it's better for you than drinking. Yeah, just smoke a tuber. You know What's something? It's good for you. I have joked around and said that if all the world just sat down at one time, literally, if we yeah, all just smoked a joint at the same time, it would probably fix Dude, a lot. They of were saying that back in the fifties with the beatniks. I, yeah, I mean, come on, what are we waiting for? That's the cure to everything. I think it's just the, every government should issue a joint to every citizen and have a mandated smoke out. Oh, don't let me forget to tell you my hemp and marijuana story. Oh, geez. All right, deal with I'm going to write that one down. Yeah, I'll write down a few questions. But Andrew Mellon had a hand in making marijuana illegal. Oh, geez. Because hemp was a Navy, uh, U.S. Navy strategic material. And so they lumped it in, all those jazz Negro cigarettes, they oh, called boy. them back in the day. Yep, yep. So we made it illegal. And it was a war on consciousness because they thought, uh-oh, people were waking up back in the 30s. Oh, geez. And they had a movie, a scare movie called Reefer Madness. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, I'm sure my grandmother, Mary Mellon, you know, she was I've like, seen that's that. bullshit. They gave... Um, cannabis oil chocolates to Queen Victoria for her menstrual cramps. And my grandfather was a doctor. And my grandmother told me that he gave her cannabis oil for her various pains mm -hmm. because it was the, it was better for you than opiates, obviously. CBD. And um, Way to be. he's like, well, it's going to make you a little high, you know? And she was like, Oh, that was cool. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother used to grow pot. I mean, it's, it's such a, Thank God they legalized it. That shows you that society is progressing. Yeah. I mean, if I could be using natural cures. Years ago, did marijuana be legal in Washington, D.C.? I would have said you were nuts. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the most locked down military city state in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, nope, it's legal. <laughs> there you go. Hey, we're, we're moving in the right directions at the very least. So, yeah. That's a positive show. move on humanity's part. I mean, really, it really is. Hey, well, it's it's legal up here too. So if you come up and visit, we'll twist what up in the woods. <laughs> All right, excellent, John. Thank you very much, and I look forward to our next chat. And I will get this thing processed and up so everyone can see it, and I'll let you know when it's there. All right, Roger, Roger. All right, John. Have a great day. Thank you too. You.